Welcome to the regular meeting of City Council of February 3rd, 2020. This meeting will now come to order. Please stand for the invocation. While we take a moment of silence, let's please remember our servicemen and women and all of our first responders. Thank you. Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Carson Lockhart from Oasis Elementary School. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Yes, Your Honor. Before I call roll, I would like to announce that Councilmember Stout has asked to be excused, and I will mark her so. Thank you. Mayor Coviello? Here. Councilmembers Cariosha? Here. Cosden? Here. Gunter? Here. Nelson? Here. Welsh? Here. Williams? Here. Seven present, one excused. Thank you. Does anybody have any changes to the agenda? I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. I have a second. Second. Madam City Clerk, call the roll. Coviello? Aye. Gunter? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Williams? Aye. Kiriosha? Aye. Cosden? Aye. All ayes. Motion carried. Okay, let's jump up to item 8 business. Item 8A is public comment on the consent agenda. A maximum of 60 minutes is set for input of citizens on matters concerning the consent agenda. Three minutes per individual. Please remember to state your name for the record. Anyone wishing to speak to an item on the consent agenda, please come to the podium. Hi, how are you? My name is Catherine Paquette. I have a question about, um, I had heard that there was a canal being built up in Northwest that would have golf access. Ma'am, you'd have to come up to her in public comment. This is on items that are just specifically in the consent agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so you, you're welcome to come up when we have public comment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak during public comment on the consent agenda? I see a none public comments closed. I will now open the consent agenda for council to pull any items. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Well, I'd like to pull an item first, resolution 28-20, which is a waiver of the procurement procedures um, and discuss a little bit about the fact that that shade meeting took place back in June of June 17th to be exact, 2019, it was seven months ago. So I'm not really understanding why we're trying to waive the procurement process, even though I know it's security measures, most of that, if I remember and recall, it was cameras and software and things of that nature. I don't see why we couldn't utilize an RFP during that period of time and why all of a sudden it's so urgent that we waived the procurement process after that meeting took place seven months ago. Chief? Police Chief Dave Newland, Mayor Council. Uh, the first, when we had that first meeting in November, we had two meetings about that to discuss security protocol. Um, obviously, there are certain things we don't want to discuss in public when doing security measures, but then there was a recommendation as well to change the process uh, as far as putting certain other implementations into the entrance of City Hall, if you recall. So we had to go back and look at that main entrance with the, metal, if you recall, the metal detector um, uh, idea concept. So we looked into that. 
We had to come back to council as well again afterwards, uh, later a few months later to discuss why it was a, a not a best practice to go that route. After that was approved from uh, you on the um, dais, we went back to look at our security items. Uh, since then, we've been doing the training on the policy and procedures for the new security AR-35 and training our staff. Uh, that's part of the process being done right now. It was just recommended because of the security measures and things we're, we're going to be purchasing for upgrades to the department. Um, as, they have, as we've done before, it was uh, recommended to um, get, uh, preclude the RFP process, the procurement, I'm sorry, the procurement process, to go ahead and so it would help us to purchase all the capital items that were agreed upon uh, for all the things we want to implement for the city hall and city buildings. Okay. Um, but when I read through the documentation, it talks about there being insufficient time or the nature of the goods or the services. So I don't understand, we haven't had any of this security measures in place. Where does the insufficient time come in? And secondly, where does the nature of the goods or services, when if I remember correctly, it was simply mostly cameras and software and entry points and things of that nature, I don't see how a request for a proposal created and submitted out in the, in the general marketplace would be detrimental to this project moving forward as opposed to just waiving the normal procurement process that we typically use when we secure goods and services for over $100,000. I believe the recommendation again was just to waive the procurement process to help out with uh, going through the security items. <coughs> if that's something you don't want to do, um, that's something we've done in the past for other security measures as we did for the charter schools as well, think, same, same I process. I honestly think we need to pull the item and have another shade meeting so we know what we're spending $300,000 on. I mean, I don't know that we even have an inkling as to what that's for. I know we ruled out certain items, which I won't bring out here, but I think we need to have a more of a discussion as to what that money is going to be spent on before we move forward on waiving the process that normally would be used. If council would choose to do that, that's fine. Um, as we as you remember, we gave the outline of the tier one, tier two, and tier three items. It was discussed on what items you want us to go, go ahead and forward to purchase, and that's what, the, that's what this money is going to be used for. But if you choose to go back and go over it again, we will gladly do that if you wish to. Well, I would ask that we do a shade meeting, uh, if we could, next Monday, if that works for the council to talk about the items that we're going to be purchasing and then bring it back forward again and make a determination whether it's done through an RFP or through the waiver of the process. Madam City Clerk, are we meeting next Monday? Um, next Monday is the 10th. Yes, we have a meeting on February 10th. So would everybody be amenable to a shade meeting at 3 o'clock? I will not be here. You won't be here? I'm going to be in Tallahassee. Okay. Well, you won't be here for the regular meeting either, then? No. Okay. Anybody else have an objection to a shade meeting at 3 o'clock? I'll be here. I'm good. You're good? You're good. Okay. Yeah, Chief? Uh, one to one just to bring something up as far as the procurement. Good evening, Council Members Wanda Root, Procurement Manager. Most of the items of that $300,000 are within the City Manager's threshold, within the $100,000 to get quotes. There's only one major item in the Tier 3 that would go over the $100,000, and it's an item that for security reasons, um, it would be preferable, the discussion was preferable for the Police Department to contact get quotes because we're still going to obtain quotes. It's still going to be a uh, that type of process, but they will be contacting to come in for discussions and get pricing per the vendor. I mean, you would follow the proper procurement. It's just not the bidding, the competitive solicitation from a formal standpoint. Okay. But quotes will still be That's obtained. not how it's presented. It's presented as $300,000 of a waiver of a procurement process, not broken into individual $100,000 increments. Yeah. Normally when we done. have a project, we want council to be aware of the whole totality of the project. So whatever council feel comfortable, we would do. But it's, it is a broken down between tier, tier one, two, and three, and there's only one major item right. that would go over the $100,000 threshold. Well, like I said, the meeting took place June 17th of 2019, seven months ago. I don't recall all of the items that were discussed. I know we ruled out one particular area that we were looking at, but you know, I'd just like to come back together in a shade meeting, take this item off for tonight, and figure out what it is that we're doing and where and when before we commit to that. Councilmember Gunther. Thank you, Mayor. 
Um, I'm okay with that. Uh, the only question that I have is, are we going to uh, add this to next week's meeting? Uh, and then we'll have the Shea meeting first, and then we can make a determination from there. Is that what your thought is on that? Well, I want to have the Shea meeting first and then figure out what we're going to do going forward okay. based on what's presented and what the security measures are going to be. And, you know, we've already said we wanted to move forward on the security measures, just specifics okay. of what's coming forward. So, yeah, I don't have a problem if we put it on next week's agenda. But okay. I think we need to see it first as to what's being purchased, what the taxpayer dollars are being spent on, and why we need to waive the procurement process is also a question that I have. I don't know why this item, if it's mostly, you know, cameras and uh, software and, you know, servers and things of that nature, why it can't be done through a normal RFP process, why we have to waive that. And that's what I'm looking to find out. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, Madam City Clerk. Your Honor, the motion on the floor is currently to approve the entire consent agenda so we would need to know if the who made the motion miss oh, council member williams could you withdraw that motion i uh, withdraw the motion in the second was council member cariosha yes okay. the second okay so we'll table that till a shade meeting next monday at three and then we can put it on the agenda to talk about it again for the february 10th for the february 10th meeting yes sir okay and then uh do I have a motion to approve the remainder of the items, item two and three? So moved. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? Madam City Clerk, call the roll. Coviello? Aye. Gunter? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Williams? Aye. Cariosha? Aye. Costin? Aye. All ayes. Motion carries. Thank you. Let's go on item 8C, citizens' input time. The so maximum of 60 minutes is set for input of citizens on matters <coughs> concerning city government, three minutes per individual. Please remember to state your name for the record. Thank you. My name is Joe Kilrain, a resident of District 3. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to comment. Uh, my comments uh, relate to a follow-up item on the uh, follow-up agenda uh, regarding vacation rentals in the Florida State House proposed Bill 1011. Uh, and my comments specifically relate to not any specifics of what our rental policy is, but in general principle, uh, and that of home rule. Uh, it's my understanding the city's current land use regulations do not allow rental periods for less than seven days. And there were some number of concerns when that was brought up last time, I think back in 2017, we were thinking about modifying. And we, we held any modifications pending the state's uh, dissemination and, and ideas about it. Um, it's not an insignificant matter as there have been times when there have been over 3,000 rentals on the, on the marketplace. So it's, it's pretty significant with, within our population. And I think that any attempt by the state or anybody to improve the and enhance the opportunity for tourism is certainly a worthy cause. Uh, my problem with this issue is that it's fundamentally flawed in that it's trying to usurp the authority of local rule uh, from the city to the state and would preempt the state's, the, the city's ability to control and regulate vacation rentals. I don't think that there's anyone in a better position than local rule and, and the city government to determine what's best on a vacation rental policy basis. So based on that, I would urge council to strongly consider putting in a protest with respect to the state and supporting any opportunity to defeat the state's bill in this case. And uh, I, I see that our, our city uh, government is uh, requesting that the, the uh, city uh, uh, league of uh, uh, managers or management staff uh, is recommending that the, it be defeated. I don't necessarily agree with all their provisions, but would support they're defeating this provision and, and home rule is a principle I think that we have to stand up for and make sure that it, it is uh, emphasized and, and uh, presented in a proper way when, when done. Um, I had a second question too relating to the uh, uh, retirement of the gas bonds uh, by a TD America note. And basically, uh, I went through all the detail in the background. I couldn't find uh, the opportunity cost benefit 
in doing that. And if it's in there, I, maybe I'm missing it. And if someone could help me point that out within the city. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to speak. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Frank Perry. I'm a 25-year resident. And just in the spirit of, uh, of uh, disclosure, I also sit on a board, a pension board, but it has nothing to do with the issue. I'm, I want to speak on uh, House Bill 1011, which is the gentleman just before me has spoke on, which is the rental. Now, as a part of the uh, uh, city manager's uh, stakeholder committee, when we discussed this uh, two years ago, and the city, uh, the vote that was taken stood pretty firm. We couldn't come up with one way or the other, but we did want to hold on to uh, the uh, the grandfather clause about the seven day rentals. So that's basically all we have left. What they've done, and it's pretty much out of our hands, and the, and the gentleman is correct here, this is a home rule issue. It's with council now, unless you call those people and put some pressure on them, they're going to dictate about the rentals in our neighborhood. Now the rentals have, a, in an R1 neighborhood, have a lot of problems. You, you have no control over the, uh, the industry that brings those people in the neighborhood. There's no accountability in the house. And we, we tried to address that two years ago, but we didn't, do, we didn't get there. Uh, so uh, as it stands now, um, you, you rent your house for seven days and you don't know who's there. We have, we have no vetting process. The police are called out to handle issues that, you know, they can't handle sometimes because there are medical issues or there are other, other kind of issues. So I really urge the council, it's up to you. It's not a, we've lost control of it out here in the audience. If you, con you know who to contact and they know what they're doing. The industry didn't get satisfaction with you because you stood for the citizens. So what do they do? They head up to Tallahassee. We all, some of us know how it works and that's where it's at now. And I really, I genuinely urge you to keep the home rule here. If we want Airbnb in, it has to come from you. It has to come as a decision from this council for this city. So please, uh, make an effort to um, put some pressure on them. You know who they are, there's two of them, and one will be in the House and one will be in the Senate, and either one of them can speak for us, and I hope that they will. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Dawn Levake. I'm just here to share my experiences with vacation rentals, seems to be a popular topic today. My husband and I live full-time in district, Southwest District 2. After retiring, we purchased our dream home in a typical residential neighborhood knowing there were long-term rentals, long-term properties, rental properties on the street. Short-term rentals weren't common in 2008. In 2015, the house next door to us was sold. The new owner introduced himself and said he bought the house for family getaways and as a vacation rental. One Friday night in April, we heard a lot of commotion next door. Woke up the next day to see about 15 cars parked in the front yard. The pool in the I were filled with people. We counted about 20 in the pool alone. We called the owner and he admitted he had a lease agreement with a leadership organization on the East Coast and 30 to 50 people would be staying there two weekends a month for three months. When we pushed back about the noise and potential misuse of the property, he caved and canceled the lease agreement. But that wasn't the end of our nightmare, it was just the beginning. We did battle with this owner for the next two years, texting and calling him and a management company agent, complaining about the noise. The house is a four bedroom, three bath with a finished garage, air conditioned, containing beds, so the house can hold a lot of people. A typical weekend involved four to five vehicles pulling in late Friday, containing multiple families, usually, usually with small children. The noise was continuous from sunup to all hours of the night. Loud music, loud voices, adults yelling, or kids screaming in the pool all day long. We called the police a couple of times. They would come and the noise would die down for one night. An officer told us we were better off talking to the owner and the renters directly. Yes, officer, are we trying that? The issues 
the issue is lots of noise is generated when a dozen or more people are party, partying in a patio setting. I called code and learned there are no local regulations for occupancy in a rental home and a residential area. Loud noise after 10 p.m. was the only ordinance enforceable. I like to think our persistence paid off because the house was sold again in July 2017. The new owners live in Colorado, but guess what? Same situation, family getaway and vacation rental. The rentals range from two days to two months, usually multiple families. The last time we called the owner complaining about the noise, he said, call the police, I'm not responsible for renter behavior. We have, had, we have had some success approaching renters and will continue to stand our ground regardless of the safety risk. We're coming up to our sixth year living next door to a resort. Moving is tempting, but we'd like to likely take a loss on the sale. So I'm very interested in hearing today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Council. Nicole with Rusty's. Um, I just wanted to address that Monday we did have a uh, special session for stockholders based on the noise ordinance changes that we're still trying to get implemented on some sort of pilot program that I'd like for you guys to be able to hear. Um, we were able to get into one of the condos across from our location during the evening when we had one of our bands. We had a police grade sound device to measure. The highest decibels that it measured was 44. I have video of it. Um, that was at the highest point. Um, we have kept our music down. We have done away with our late night music and it's killing our sales. It's hurting my bartenders. Um, we just wanna be able to address it and, and try and get some sort of middle ground. During the special meeting, a lot of the condo owners and ourselves admitted that there is a middle ground we can come to. Obviously, it is going to be to create some sort of decibel rating. Friday, we had the police called on us. It was raining. I explained during the meeting weather, cloud coverage can also make vibrations a little stronger. We had no music on. We had no sound on except for a small TV volume, and we had the police called on us on Friday. And the disturbance was, we hear drums from Rusty's. So we got a, a noise disturbance, and it wasn't even us. It was another restaurant. We're getting singled out, and it's killing our sales. I just want the council to be able to address some sort of decibel reading that's fair. I mentioned it at the last meeting. A children's hearing device for age three to seven for school systems, a safe level is 75 decibels. So if my three-year-old can wear a 75 decibel earphone, I wanna be able to have some sort of decibel reading for late night music. Um, we agree that the condo owners do need to have peace and quiet. But like I said, we were in there during Soul Lixer playing with windows open and the highest it measured was 44 decibels. The windows weren't shaking, the floors weren't shaking. I just wanna to come to some sort of fair conclusion that lets us succeed in our business that we've put millions of dollars in and allows the, the homeowners to still have the peace they want. But it's an entertainment district. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I flipped a switch here. Right here, right? Oh, good. We are ready in a second here. Haven't been here in a while, but happy to be here. Kimberly, there we go. Have you seen that? Okay. Can't read it. Can we zoom it in or out? Too small. Well, the police sent it to me to complain to them. How's that? All right. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. Lou Navarre, 47 year resident of the Cape. Have you heard the saying, it's like calling the cops on the cops? Remember Dragnet? Just the facts, ma'am. Jack Webb, fact one, I was illegally arrested on August 10th, 2018 by unprofessional officers, Wilson, Cody, Causer, and Barkley. Body cam and official court reports show Officer Wilting go goading and ranting to Officer Cody that I'm a drunk and getting campaign signs at 4 a.m. A lie. I had only one campaign sign in the area. Officer Cody uses profanity about me. What is he 
blank thinking, and it starts with an F. I wonder who he loves there. Burglary oh fun, let's find this guy. He must be a stalker. I'm a 46 year teacher, still employed by the district, if I wanted to work. Officer Causer and Barkley obeyed, aided and abetted the illegal arrest. Not all body cams are on, which I think is contrary to police policy. On the body cam that is on, Officer Wilson is seen writing burglary. Complainants are seen asking for a restraining order, that was all. Fact six, it's easier to fire a four-year college degree teacher than a high school diploma officer with six months, six to eight months boot camp. Remedy. City Council immediately appoints an independent committee to review all complaints that CCPIA denies. They never saw anything wrong. Two, an independent civilian committee be set up for all Lee County to investigate citizens' complaints on law enforcement agencies if they disagree with their IAs. Three, all officers take yearly in-service on bullyism and sensitivity training. Four, all officers and new recruits must have an AA degree from a community college. For me to just substitute in a district, I need an AA degree. Abolish if it's in place, promotions based on arrests or vehicle citations. I have filed a lawsuit in federal court against the CCPD for violation of my civil rights. I'm an honorably discharged veteran, 75 year old widower, 46 year teacher and had never been arrested. I'm humiliated, I was running for school board. I will contact Governor DeSantis, our local legislatures to set up a statewide law enforcement certification department, just like the teachers do. Folks, you need to back me. This could happen to you. Let's look at the rest of it. There's the cussing part. Here's uh, some more of the uh, stuff here. I'm picking up signs at four in the morning. I couldn't afford signs. This is your business. Thank you, Mr. Navarro. Yeah, well, don't you want to see these? They're wonderful. <laughs> Police officer. I'm going to call him right now. I didn't know that guy was a thing. Thank you, so Mr. Which Navarro. Which one do you think is Thank you. in love with? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That's Thank okay. You. It's public record. You can go to the federal court and get everything you want. Thank you, Mr. Navarro. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. You're a good guy. Thank you. Eyes on. Thank you. Hello, Council. My name is Mike Henshaw. I live near the entertainment district. I'm hoping that we can resolve the sound issue shortly. Perhaps we can use the uh, sound reading devices to come up with a uh, borderline to know when it's over and how far our bars can take the noise. We enjoy the music, but if there's a way to cut it off at a certain sound level. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Carl Vo for the record. The Chamber of Commerce House on uh, Bernie Braden Park uh, deserved to stay there. The department head of Parks and Rec says they're afraid that the fish and game will find them uh, if something happens during red, white, and boom to them. But we, uh, Cape Coral Friends of Wildlife, have found that there are many owls on the parade route of the bike nights and other nights that should remove, be removed too if this is the case and I don't really think it is because these owls have survived these bike nights uh, for years. The burrowing owls of the chamber are a great asset to the chamber. They can show the people what we have in the Cape, the owls, and I, it, it just takes one resolution from you. They have the permit to destroy it, and I don't think they should. They've been there through the red, white, and boom. The Cape Coral Friends of Wildlife will guard them during red, white, and boom, and that's the only time that they need to be guarded because there's nothing else that comes down that way. 
but it's up to you. If you want to save them, somebody has to make a resolution to do so. I called my representative. She didn't even call me three days ago. Another thing that really concerns me just as much as the four mile code violations. Is somebody prosecuting the person that destroyed 700 feet of mangroves when they only had a permit to destroy 100? I hope the police, 100 uh, feet of the, that mangrove, I hope the police are investigating this. This is a crime and it should be persecuted. The other thing is the uh, fish and game have pictures of sticks in the, in the um, um, gopher tortoise uh, uh, burrows. Is somebody doing something about that? That's a crime. But I called the, the police and they said, oh, it has to be done by the owner, but if I see somebody shooting a deer on somebody's property, I have a right to tell them, and I have a right to tell you that you don't put sticks in burrowing owl nest and get away with it in Cape Coral. And I want this investigated by the police and you should look into that. And uh, the roads as well, did they have permits to put these roads in? I don't think so, I haven't heard of anything about a permit to put these roads in. This was a purely against the law and I hope you're doing something about it. Thank you for your consideration in this matter and it should be looked into both cases. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ruth Jenkins. I live at the Sandpiper, so I am near the entertainment district, but I don't live in the entertainment district. I live in a residential area. Um, we had a lot of problems last year with very late music, very high decibel levels. Uh, the decibel levels last year were between 80 and 90 decibels as late as 2.30 in the morning, and that's a measurement from our front porches. So uh, I realize that we're near the entertainment district and the people in the entertainment district want to make money, but I want to get sleep at night. And we had a lot of people come to the meeting this week. We had representatives from 10 different condo units um, that, that talked about the fact that they were not able to get their rest. There's a woman just two units down from me who has, she teaches school. So on Thursday morning and Thursday evening when there's late bands, if, if these bands go again till 2.30 in the morning and then she has to get up and go in to teach, she's got a daughter who goes to elementary school. I was a school teacher, I wouldn't want my children to be up till 2.30 in the morning and then have to go in and put a day in at school. I think that's an adverse effect on a child and they deserve a right to education. Um, I know that there are people in my condo unit that are trying to sell their condos. Phyllis is one of my neighbors. Her condo's been for sale for a while. People come and uh, quite a few people have come to look at the condo and when they see that Rusty's is right across the street, that's kind of the end of it. And I know she had people come into her condo um, this past week or two ago that came in and sat inside her condo for hours with their sound equipment when they didn't have her permission. Um, they did this under circumstances saying that they uh, were there to look at the condo for purchase, but they were really there to do their own sound checks, which um, I'm, I know she's pursuing some type of uh, resolution on that. We have a lot of people that um, work full time in our district. I think people think because we're retired we can just stay up all hours of the night any day that, that the music wants to go late. I thought that um, the entertainment district would be looking at ways to mitigate sound in our area. I haven't heard anything with that, um, any type of um, professional company coming out and helping them lower the sound. But please don't give them permission to have bands again till 2.30 in the morning when people have to work the next day. 
Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Kimberly. I am a homeowner here in Cape Coral. I spoke a couple of weeks ago on the same issue of the sound ordinance and to respectfully disagree with Ms. Jenkins. Um, there's people who have to work, but we don't all work the same schedule. For instance, I work nights. My typical day doesn't start until 4 p.m. As a result, I like to go out later at night. So if I'm not getting out until 10 p.m. and I know that my bar can't play music until 11, or they have to shut off their music at 11, well, I'm just going to go to Fort Myers because I wanna stay out and have a couple of drinks and I wanna listen to some music. And I'm also here to remind you that people in my age group, people in my demographic, they represent the majority of your city. If you want Cape Coral to grow as a city, if you want this place to be a foundation for people like me to plant roots, grow our families, have long-term residence where we can thrive and build and grow, then don't push us away. I pay property taxes here, and right now my government is not working to appease me. I feel that my city council is appeasing a very small group of people who seem to have an issue with where they live compared to the entertainment district. I would like to point out the residential area that Ms. Jenkins lives in is on 47th, or I'm sorry, Southeast 46th Lane. Now, Southeast 46th Lane is actually the line of the entertainment district. So that's where the entertainment district cuts off. She literally lives across the street from the entertainment district. Maybe not technically in it, but you do live right across the street. The street is the dividing line of the entertainment district. Now, as some people have already pointed out, 75 decibels is safe. It is considered safe by the World Health Organization, and most cities have a standard of 75 decibels for their sound ordinances. That's not unreasonable or excessive. And to ask that we shut down all of our late night entertainment in the area at 11 p.m., well, you're just driving business out of the city at that point. The city relies on business tax revenue in order to fund projects, such as the 47th Terrace Streetscape. They just cost millions to make a more pedestrian friendly and inviting area for people to come and spend their money in Cape Coral. We want the economy to grow. The sound ordinance has so far hurt my personal income, business revenue, and has made me feel pressure to decide quickly if I want to remain in the city or sell my home and move now before it loses property value as I feel that if businesses leave, residents are gonna be very quick to follow. So please keep in mind again who you want to appease as I am the citizen who represents your majority in Cape Coral. I live in Southwest Cape and I have never had a problem with noise in my neighborhood. I also live in a residential area. If I chose to live that close to the entertainment district, I wouldn't be complaining because I was paying for the convenience of where I live. You don't move into an apartment in Manhattan, New York, and then complain about the noise. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karen Sunhalter, and I'm a um, resident of 46 Lane um, at the famous um, Sandpiper Apartments. Um, I'm here, well, first of all, what I wanna do is say that first of all, I, uh, I really don't want this ordinance opened up again, and I participated in the meeting last week, and despite the fact coming out of there, it looks like we're headed towards doing more sound measurement, and uh, quite honestly, I don't think that's gonna solve the issue. I don't think that we have gone deep enough and really examined this issue enough. So, and here we go again. You're hearing the same things that we've been here talking to you before. Um, we're talking from our opinion from the uh, residential side. Rusty's comes and has a different opinion. Um, I'll tell you what I think the, we ought to consider as a, an option. Um, I always have problems with this, so. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, I, think it's, I think it's time for a, an actual study, for money to put in, be put into um, really examining the problem of the noise 
um, in our area and you know someone that actually does come in and do a well-conceived noise impact analysis which hasn't been performed. Um, this organization that you see here, uh, they basically, um, they're a group that has done this whole study on noise impacts and they have suggestions as to how communities can look at noise and reach to some sort of accommodation between the residents and the uh, and the businesses. I would suggest, I am gonna email this to everyone on council and to the mayor, and I would really appreciate it if you'd read this and reconsider what we're doing. Actually think about um, um, putting some money into getting prof professionals in to look at the situation and consider the whole environment, um, look at the noise aspects, consider the, um, all of the health hazards that are associated with, uh, with noise. Now we've been accused of, of being um, aged people, but we are the uh, people that surround the entertainment district. And you really have to consider all the, the noise impacts for one of the f most fragile communities. I mean, we are the people that would be most affected by this noise and um, the uh, long-term health impacts to us should be considered when, when looking at this. So at any rate, um, I would really appreciate it if you all would read the document. I will circulate to you and have discussions about whether you should proceed with just these measurements going forward or whether you really need to dig in and understand this, this problem um, before you, you go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Joan Leahy and I live in the perimeter of the entertainment area in District 1. Um, I also attended the, uh, the meeting on January 29 about the uh, noise ordinance. And I'd like to state that I do support the current noise ordinance and proper enforcement of it. And I also um, state that for reasons which I'll explain later, I do not support the trial period proposed. I have some observations and thoughts. On January 30th, around 9 p.m., as I walked along uh, Southeast 46 Lane, I had the opportunity to, to experience firsthand the level of sound coming from the band at Rusty's. Frankly, I was appalled at the level of noise. I thought, how can the residents in this area deal with this level of noise disturbance on a regular basis and have reasonable enjoyment of their properties? As a concerned citizen, I decided to do some cursory research on the impact of noise pollution on health. Here are my findings. In 2011, the World Health Organization, WHO, released a report that stated, and I quote, Exposure to prolonged or excessive noise has shown to cause a range of health problems ranging from stress, poor concentration, fatigue from lack of sleep to more serious issues such as cardiovascular disease, cognitive impairment, tinnitus, and hearing loss, unquote. The report also stated that our bodies are being affected by noise pollution even when we speak, even when we are asleep. It appears that continual noise sets off the body's acute stress response, which raises blood pressure and heart rate. It is this response that can lead to cardiovascular disease and other health issues, such as gastrointestinal changes and effects on mental health. The website for the Center for Health and Communication reports that, and I quote, even noise that may not be at hazardous levels to our hearing makes us tense and angry, unquote. Incidentally, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, identified an indoor night average sound level of 35 dBAs to protect against sleep disturbance. In closing, I believe it's imperative that this noise ordinance discussion includes the emphasis on the health issues affected by noise pollution. In light of my findings, conducting the proposed trial would not address these issues. In my opinion, a professional sound mitigation study should be conducted instead. Our citizens have the right to peace and quiet during the nighttime. Their physical and mental health depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Catherine Paquette. I had heard that there was a canal that was gonna be built out up in northwest Cape Coral near Jacaranda, potentially leading out to the Gulf. 
and I've done some research but haven't found anything and just thought I'd come and ask about it. If there was someone I could talk to about it, I'm just not sure who. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else wishing to speak to our citizens' input? Seeing none, citizens' input's now closed. Council Member Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, I'm going to address a few of these. I'm going to start at the bottom and work up. Mr. Kett, on the canal up at the north end of the spreader, highly unlikely that it's ever going to happen. Um, the uh, DEP will not permit it. The Army Corps of Engineers will not permit it. And even if they did, you'd just go through the preserve and end up with a half a mile of mud before you could get out in open water. So the, the cost would be prohibitive, uh, plus those two uh, monitoring agencies will not allow it. So uh, I know the rumor's been going around for years, and we haven't made any progress toward that happening. So sorry. It's a nice ride down the spreader anyway. A lot of pretty houses. So. Um, Mr. Bo, Carl, um, you know, we really appreciate everything you do for the Friends of Wildlife and the owls and the tortoises and everything. Um, you are a, a, always in here promoting them, and that, that's really great. Um, I want to congratulate you for the, the great article that was in The Breeze uh, recently, uh, the write-up that they did on you. And that was really accurate, and it was very good. So keep coming. It, it's a pleasure to listen to you, and uh, you're, you're right on target as far as uh, working with the wildlife in the city. I wish we could do more of what you suggest. Uh, Mr. Perry, Frank, I'm going to Tallahassee next week to talk exactly about what you came up here about. Home rule is the number one target. It's, and it's really bad this year. They're attacking us from many different directions. Um, I'm going to be scheduling meetings with the uh, local delegation representatives. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be going around with our uh, lobbyists, the paid lobbyists we have, and uh, we'll be going around doing the best we can to try to get them to reconsider some of these things they're doing. Another high one on my list is the fireworks. I don't know how to get through that one, but. Um, so we're, it's not that we're not paying attention, it's just that we have um, opportunities throughout the year to actually go face to face with these people. And that's what we're gonna try to do next week. So, but anyway, thanks for coming. Don't give up. Don't put any money on it, but don't give up. Uh, sometimes it can be a little hard to uh, work with. Um, and the noise ordinance, I don't know what to say. You know, I understand what you folks are saying. I fortunately do not live down there. Um, I understand what the issue is with the noise. The, uh, you know, obviously people that go to these bars and hear bands, they want them as loud as they can be, and I'll never understand that because it doesn't make the music any better, it just makes it louder. But uh, all, all I can say is, you know, we're, the police department have some guidelines they can follow, and if it's really out of control, call them and see what we can do. I would like to be able to uh, hope that the bars and restaurants will tune it down a little bit, but I can't, uh, can't, can't guarantee that one. Uh, I, I was young once too, and I like my music cranked up. And that's it, Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Gunter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think uh, Councilmember Williams uh, addressed most of the issues that uh, I was gonna talk about. There any other? issue that I wanted to elaborate a little more on is the uh, noise ordinance. Myself and uh, Council Member Nelson attended the uh, meeting uh, last week uh, with the residents and the businesses, along with the police chief. Uh, and I think it was about 32 people, 30 to 32 people who uh, came to the meeting, uh, business owners and residents. And pretty much what you heard today is the same thing that we heard during the meeting. Uh, the residents are looking uh, for some type of uh, relief or to at least continue the ordinance. And then the business owners were looking for some type of uh, relief uh, with the current ordinance. 
because after 11 p.m., they can't play any music at all. Now, first of all, this is a citywide ordinance that we have to take into effect that it's for everyone, not just the downtown district. I think when you look at the downtown district, the business that's probably impact the most is Rusty's. There, during the discussion, uh, there was some suggestions that maybe we would just apply a decibel level instead of a band of all amplified sound. Now, there was a few good points that I think was made during the meeting. Amplified sound could be watching TV on your lanai at any level. So that would be illegal. So basically, we passed an ordinance that says after 11 p.m., if you turn your TV on, you can watch it. You just can't turn your volume on. We also said that if you want to talk on your telephone and use speakerphone, that's illegal because that's an amplified sound. Now, I'll tell you that I was supportive of the noise ordinance. Uh, but when some of the problems started to come forward regarding it, I thought maybe there was a better approach and a better avenue in order to govern the noise late at night. During the meeting, I made a suggestion that maybe we do some type of a 60-day uh, pilot program or a 60-day study that uh, we could have the police department monitor uh, before 11 and after 11 to see where these decibel levels are and give us some good hard facts and try to come up with some data-driven analysis that we can take a look at this problem. Right now, the uh, ordinance, the way it's written, they can't do that. Uh, I think that what we need to do as a council, first off, is put this as an agenda item on our next council meeting next week. And the reason that I say that, we have a handful of people here today uh, that has come forward to discuss this. But I think that we need to put it out properly so all of public gets a notice as far as if they go on our web page to see what our agenda item is. So they are given the opportunity to come here and speak just like you did today. At the end of that meeting, I think council has to decide do we want to keep status quo, keep the regulation the way it is? Or do you think that additional information is needed to take a look at this ordinance? And that's something that we will have to decide collectively. In my opinion, we need to decide that collectively. Once we've made that determination, if we do want to uh, take a look at this ordinance, gather some more data, uh, approach this for a period of time in an educational aspect where all parties uh, will get the information that they need to come up with a good informed decision. That may be a, a route that we want to take. I hear the residents. I know you have a concern. And, but when you take a look at the noise ordinance, it says no amplified sound. I think that we need to look at that a little closer because, like I said, technically you can't have anything outside after 11 p.m., no matter if it's a cell phone, a television, anything of that nature. So maybe a decibel level may be a way to take a look at how to govern. I don't know. That's why I think the data is so important for that possibly a 60-day period. But there again, that's something the council will have to make that decision collectively. Mayor, I'd ask to maybe the meeting next week if we could put this on for an agenda item so it is properly vetted in the community where if anyone has an opportunity, they can come in and uh, discuss what their point of view is. And then at the end, as a council, we can make a determination how we want to approach this. Leave it the way it is or come up with some other type of alternative to take a look at the uh, information on for a period of time. Thank you.
Councilman McGunter, I, I don't have a problem putting it on next week's agenda, but I don't think we're going to have much more information about the direction to go in a week's time. If you're thinking that we need to have maybe some more interaction from the police department as far as the ordinance that's on the books was passed and approved, and that's what we have to work with going forward. Now, certainly, you know, if we decide to tweak that, if we put it on the agenda and we just talk about it, what, what other information are we going to have next week to try to finalize this and put it to rest? In other words, I don't see how a one week's time period will give us enough information to move something forward if we so desire. You know, it sounds like there's two issues to me from what I'm hearing. One is the amplified sound wording, and the second one is the decibel level that's been approved. I think it was if I'm not mistaken, what, 67 after 11 and uh, was it 85 before? 65 and 75. 65 and 75. So, you know, those, Chief Nolan, please approach, approach the podium. I just don't want to go on the agenda and then we're going to still have the same discussion next week about where do we take this. In other words, what's your recommendation as far as how do we come up with a potential solution that's going to make everybody go away from the table Maybe not totally happy, but somewhat satisfying. Uh, Chief Newland, Mayor and Council, uh, if I may suggest, what I've talked to my staff about today, and I like to have them start this Thursday night, is just go out and, and test different locations, not only south, but other locations, uh, the decibel levels, and we're talking more or less the DBCs. That's your, that's your, that's your base. Um, before 11 and after 11, based on what the ordinance uh, stipulates on the property line, um, and then I want to do, I don't want to start putting that data together now, but if we see, based on the measurement, I want them to, um, in fact, I even talked to Rusty's today even, and the other day, because I want to see if we can help them strategically, uh, other places as well, with their sound, uh, maybe help them put them in better locations, and with sound buffering recommendations, things that may help. Anything we can do for the residents, it may be, a, a could be help on both sides. So I've asked that, uh, my staff start doing that now, so if they do see they're over, anybody for that matter, make contact with management, um, show them what we're reading and see what we can do, what's causing that. Is it, is it maybe something as, as Soon, as easy as turn your speakers the other direction um, or moving the location to somewhere else on the property source. So I'd like to start doing that. That may give us a direction. Are we in the right level of decibels right now? Is, it, is that uh, reasonable? Is it not reasonable? I think if I come back with data after a certain time, they may tell us where we're at as well. But I think by educating and helping work with the, some of the establishments um, starting sooner than later may be a win-win for everybody. Do you think the three days before Monday's meeting is going to give you enough time to do what you just said? I, I would like, if it's okay with Kelly, I'd like more time to at least do a 60-day period. I can report back, but at least it gives us a time to kind of give us a better level of all that time frame of data to kind of see where, where we stand at. Okay. Um, and, and that may help us in it as well if we work with some of the establishments. Um, maybe we can help maybe make some different changes or tweaks to their how they have things laid out may be, uh, again, may help everybody. Thank you. Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think what I'm hearing is that the police chief is offering up an opportunity to basically engage in a period of approximately 60 days in which he will gather more information, identify further specific problems down there in the, uh, for example, not just in the entertainment district, but elsewhere in the city. Um, particularly with regard to the audible, um, the, um, audible sound provision, and investigate any uh, factors that may be coming into play here, any aggravating factors or ameliorating factors that may be coming into play. And I think what I'm hearing is that he wants to use that 60-day period as a time to gather information that will ultimately be presented to the City Council, um, rather than to immediately engage in strict citation mode based on the ordinance. And if that's acceptable to the council, if council doesn't have any objection, then I think that's what he's offering up and would be intending to bring forward to you. Thank you. The only question, can we c complete something in 30 days? I mean, we've got a lot of people that are coming to these meetings kind of repeatedly, and you know, 60 days is two months. I mean, when you think about it, 30 days will give you, uh, what, approximately four weekends, maybe eight, 
to 10 nights to take a look at what's going on. Is that feasible that it can be done? We can do that time? if the council chooses to, to look at for a 30 day period. Um, again, I'm hoping that, uh, and I'm hearing more of a Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights is there are the main nights. Okay. So if we do those three nights, um, and again, if we do identify problems, like as I mentioned before, that may help. Right. And okay. it, by doing that and, and making, making sure that the levels are lower, it should hopefully, um, it, should, it should be good for the residents as well too, because we want to maintain okay. that, that we don't go over the required level. So you'd be okay with trying to do a 30 day study as opposed to a 60, because I'd yeah. like to see it move along. Absolutely, we'll work on that. Okay, Councilmember Gunter, are you okay with, with those thoughts? And yeah, then maybe the set, set it for an agenda that's you know a month down the road. That's fine, I was willing to talk about it tonight. Uh, so uh, I have no problem uh, with that and I don't have any problem with a 30 day study. Uh, I think that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, I think how they're gonna approach it is kind of look at the 65 and 75 decibel that is set now and use that as a, as a baseline. Benchmark. Mm -hmm. And uh, see where the establishments are. Yes. And my understanding, you're only gonna do that on those three nights of the week. That seems to be the main nights that I'm hearing about. Um, and we'll talk to the, the other establishments too. If there's other nights we may need to do, we'll do that as well. But I know from talking to them, it seems like, and not just Rusty, I mean other places, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday seem to be the main nights they have entertainment or um, that we could gauge on off that, and that will give us a, a, a level, a baseline to see where we stand at, at after 30 days. Thank you. Come Mr. back at. That's all I have. Thanks, Mr. Zerlag. Thank you. I, I'm also going to be asking staff to look at this from a technology side to see if there's any sound attenuation elements out there that may help mitigate noise at a property line, whether it's through speakers or other kind of baffles that may or may not be cost uh, uh, prohibitive. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I wanna say that I'm sorry, Carl, that I didn't call you back. I've been under the weather for a few weeks, but you're on my list because I have an owl question. But with that said, so I'm sorry, I'm your re representative and I didn't return your call, so I'm sorry. We'll but I, okay, I will, I promise, just don't yell at me. I don't wanna be yelled at, no, I'm kidding. Um, but um, Mike, I, could you come up real quick and talk about the two owls again, um, just for public, so the public can hear about the issue in terms of collapsing the burrow versus just moving them. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and the cost? Sure. Um, city staff uh, involving Public Works, Parks and Rec, uh, our environmental consultant, consultant with Johnson Engineering, um, got on a phone call with FWC, both of the uh, regulatory body that is in force of permitting the incidental takes, and we also uh, had the environmental biologists who enacted the law to protect the species. So we had a you know a nice big conference call with all parties involved and went through kind of the risk analysis and the process involved with figuring out whether or not it was in the city's best interest to continue with the incidental take permit at Bernice Braden Park. At the end of that, you know, to summarize the, the call, several things came into play. Um, if we disturb 50% or more of the property in the vicinity of the owl, such as its foraging habitat, then that's going to be considered a take. So even if you were to come up with an area to protect the species, you know, you heard last week somebody say, can't we just protect that square footage that's right there? The, the species protection laws and the biologists actually have gone much farther than that when they created the legislation designating it. So they actually look at the amount of area available to the species to forage. Part of what uh, Public Works is doing, some of you all may know it was part of the CTACs, we're looking at putting in lands enhanced landscaping, we're looking at putting in sidewalks, we're looking at putting in hardscapes. All of those things impact the species foraging habitat area and go into the take. In addition to that, we have Red, White and Boom, which has, you know, 40, 50,000 residents that show up there. Uh, we discussed uh, the ability, you know, residents have asked, can't we just move a tent? Can't we just move a stage? Can't we move bleachers? Yes, all that can be done. The things that cannot be protected against is unless you build an actual castle around them is 
an emergency vehicle that needs to respond to somebody who's having a heart attack or some other life safety issue. If they have to go through that area, they're gonna run over it. If you have a fire and an explosion with the fireworks or the stage and there's a mass exodus, that area is gonna be trampled. If you have, if we have somebody who becomes inebriated and they start harassing the owls, you know, yes, we can try and intervene, but in the meantime, they've been harassed. So there's a lot of other variables that go into trying to protect just that square footage that we can or cannot um, protect against. As a result of all that, uh, what happens is the FWC told us on the phone that they cannot force us to get a permit. So if, if we do not want to, the city does not have to. But the fact that we know that we are doing all the changes to the foraging habitat and the fact that we know we're not gonna move red, white, and boom, all those potential threats to the species exist. And should we not do that and something happens, we will face civil penalties and fines because we permitted it already and we know about all these potential risks to the species. As a result of that, the city team and the environmental ecologists that went through that phone call with the biologists and the re regulatory permitting people came to the conclusion it's in the city's best interest as an insurance plan to safely relocate those owls from that park because we don't intend on moving the event. It will be there year after year and we intend on doing uh, long-term uh, changes to that park in regards to its foraging habitat. So. Yes, there are, there seems like a lot of simple solutions, but when you put the entire package together, the best thing to do is to just safely move the species along, let them relocate to another area, and we can have the event and make the changes we want at the park. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about really quickly was the noise ordinance. Um, to echo Council Member Gunter, I do agree. I think the 30-day time frame is good. The one thing I would strongly recommend, I only stayed at the meeting for about 30 minutes um, because of the sunshine law potential issue and I felt like one of us should speak and given it was in council member Gunter's district, I opted to leave. Um, but one of the things or takeaways that I got in that short time was the amplified sound uh, piece of that ordinance, which I would recommend that we remove. Um, when it does come back up, um, in addition to the research that uh, the chief does. Um, and then also, I want to say, I'm sorry, Council Member Gunter, because I was overzealous in opening um, that back up, and I should have asked you that night if you wanted to take it on, because it's in your district. So I'm giving it back if you want it. <laughs> I'll support you. I'll be your second. I'll be your cheerleader. But um, I will give that back to you if you would like to. Um, take it from me and, and come back to council with the recommended changes. Sure, that'll be fine, thank you. Okay, awesome. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Chris, Chris Phillips, could you come up? We had one question about the, uh, the gas tax refinancing of the bonds. Somebody wanted to know what the advantages were. Could you just give us a quick rundown on that? Yes, uh, good evening, Mayor and Council, Chris Phillips, Acting uh, Finance Director. Uh, we have a presentation here coming up, but okay. the long and short of it is we're refunding about $33 million worth of bonds, and we're saving about um, $4.7 million total without extending the maturity date of those bonds. Excellent, okay, thank you. Just so the resident got an answer. I hate to bring up the owls again, but I just want to ask Mr. Ilchism, did we collapse that burrow once before and they came back? They came back. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, last year in an effort to continue um, not having a conflict with uh, J July 4th, Red, White, and Boom event, we got some lobbyists involved, tried to, you know, had some staff working. We, were, we figured, figured out a lot of things in their state's process that delayed getting the permit, and we able to work through a lot of that. We did, were able to collapse the, the um, nest. Uh, another nest did come back. We're not sure whether or not somebody went there and did a starter burrow or they came back on their own. Um, we did subsequently uh, collapse that because our permit said it was valid through 2020. Uh, only to find out that my, that my was... My question is, where are we at now? Are we going to leave it alone? Are we going to go collapse it? I mean, what are we going to do? I mean, my feeling is I find wildlife to be somewhat resilient. And we have lots of burrowing owls downtown, near the streets, near the curbs that survive bike night, 
and a lot of going on stuff that takes place. So at the, at the recommendation of FWC, we filed a permit amendment to change our single permit into a programmatic permit that would be good for three years up to 10, net, up to 10 borough clusters. Okay. So we're actually amending the permit that we have to allow us to, uh, as this, if this continues, uh, to keep moving them off. Part of that permit submittal though is including uh, adding some hardscapes such as you know, rocks and trees, things that would deter them from coming back to the same site. The other question I had is we have one of the parks which has a couple of burrowing owls and there was some discussion about changing the walking trails a little bit so they could stay. Where are we at with that? So that's Sands Park. Uh, we did have a meeting with the consultants uh, related to Sands, uh, which is AECOM. And in that park, what we're running up against is that 50% development threshold. That total acreage that's involved with Sands Park, even though we may be able to move a sidewalk or move a tree, because we're developing that entire park, we are going to be destroying more than 50% of its their foraging habitat. So we're likely going to have to ha be required by the state law to take all those burrows and then do on-site mitigation afterwards and put starter burrows. So there was no way to redesign the park in such a way that that wouldn't happen? Not unless we leave 50% of it natural. So by, by in essence of basically going in there and putting in an entire park, again, the biologists don't just look at that 33 feet or the 25 feet that most people are familiar with. They're looking at the owls foraging habitat and where they're gonna get food. So if you think about it, if you just leave them on a concrete island, they're gonna die. So they're not gonna be able to have any food. So they're either gonna have to move on on their own or through the permitting process, they require you to do starter burrows or pay into a mitigation fund. Thank you. Councilmember Gunter? I'm done. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, any other discussion on citizens' input? So, Chief, we're going to do a 30 day kind of comeback. We'll get it on the agenda when he has his data, and then we'll discuss the noise ordinance a little further. Okay, let's move on. The personnel actions. Well, Mayor, since I see no one at the podium, I just want to mention that uh, during the negotiation process, I was initially authorized 3% uh, by Mayor and Council for three years to settle labor contracts. Um, after a, a second shade meeting, I was authorized 3.25% uh, for public mm -hmm. works, and so I asked if that could also be given to the extra 2.5% per annum for the police and fire departments. I was told yes, and what you have before you is a uh, recommendation from both the fire union and city management on how they wish to utilize the 0.25% a year for the next three years. Approval was recommended. Thank you. We have a motion to approve resolution 298-19. So moved. Second. Second. Any other discussion? Madam City Clerk, call the roll. Coviello. Aye. Gunter. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Welsh. Aye. Williams. Aye. Gariosha. Aye. Austin. Aye. All ayes. Motion carried. Okay, thank you. Let's go on to uh, item 8F, appointments to boards and committees. We have uh, application for the Construction Regulation Board. Madam City Clerk. <laughs> Yes, Your Honor. Before you this evening, we have the we have three vacancies for Construction Regulation Board. At this time, we are in receipt of one applicant, Paul Gates, who is here today presently. If you'd like him to come to the podium, okay. Um, he does qualify for one of the vacancies as the consumer representatives. Very good. Can I get a motion to appoint Paul Gates to the Construction Regulation Board? So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Madam City Clerk, call the roll. Coviello? Aye. Gunter? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Williams? Aye. Kiriosha? Aye. Costin? Aye. All ayes, motion carried. Thank you. Let's go on to item nine, specifically public hearings 9A, ordinance 1-20. Madam City Clerk, please read the title. 
Ordinance 1-20, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Cape Coral, Florida, amending the Charter, Article 4, Government, Section 4.03, Election and Terms, amending the date for the primary elections to be held on the Tuesday, 11 weeks prior to the general election, providing for severability and an effective date. Thank you. Do you have staff comments? Your Honor, I brought this forward after working with the legal department. There okay. was a change in the uh, legislation in July, and it is a housekeeping item. Okay. Madam City Attorney? This change doesn't require going to a referendum because it's merely dealing with the election dates. Okay. Well, so I'll go straight to opening public input. I'll now open up public input. Anyone wishing to speak on Ordinance 1-20, please come forward. Seeing none, public input's closed. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Coviello? Aye. Gunter? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Williams? Aye. Hiriosha? Aye. Costin? Aye. All ayes, motion carried. Okay, let's go on ordinance 2-20. Madam City Clerk, please read the title. Ordinance 2-20, an ordinance amending the City of Cape Coral Comprehensive Plan by amending the future land use map from Pine Island Road District to single-family residential land use for property described as lots 1 through 52, block 3682, and lots 1 through 55, block 3685, all in Unit 50, Cape Coral Subdivision. Property located on Southwest 19th Avenue and Southwest 18th Court, north of Pine Island Road and south of Southwest 4th Street, providing severability and an effective date. Thank you, Chad. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. For the record, Chad Boyko, Principal Planner with, this, with the City's Planning Division. This is Ordinance 2-20. This is a privately initiated future land use map amendment. And this was initiated by the City of Cape Coral as a fix to our calibration uh, ordinance. When we adopted our <coughs> back in August of last year, we had numerous zoning and land use changes. And while we were going through, we noticed that there was some fixes to be made. And this is one of those fixes that is being brought before you. This is a large scale future land use map amendment. So this would be something that would be transmitted up to the state. It would go through state review. It would come back and then it would be an adoption eventually before you guys again. Uh, the size of the site is a little under 14 acres. The current future land use of the site is Pine Island Road District, but the zoning is single family residential. Uh, they, uh, the request is a future land use amendment from the PARD district to single family residential land use district. This is an aerial of the map on the left hand side of your screen. Uh, it's surrounded in yellow. We'll get a zoomed in picture here. This is just to give you an overview of what's around there. Uh, to the north, you have single family homes on both of these two blocks. To the west, you have a large undeveloped tract. Uh, it's known, it's what we commonly refer to as the mall site, even though that may not be what is eventually developed there. The German American Club is also located to the west of there. To the east is a former borough pit, uh, which is currently undeveloped. And in between the two blocks is a, uh, another block that consists of single family homes that also has single family land use and zoning. And then on the right hand side of your screen, you can see the existing zoning of the site. Uh, it's outlined in blue and the zoning at the site is single family residential. The existing future land use is Pine Island Road District, and then the proposed future land use would be single family residential. And here is just a more zoomed in picture of the two blocks that we're thinking about changing back to single family residential. Uh, currently there's around eight or nine homes that have been developed so far within these two blocks. Uh, the aerial is a little old as there has been two homes that sort of made their way through permitting and they are either under construction or nearly finished but they have not shown up on the aerial maps that we have on record. Some more findings of fact, the site consists of a portion of two blocks, 3685 and 3682. Uh, it's currently a mix of undeveloped parcels and single family homes. It has frontage on two local streets. It does not have any access to any arterial or collector streets. The future land use of the site was originally mixed use back in 1990. Uh, however, it was changed to the Pylon Road District in 2002 as part of the Pylon Road Master Plan. Uh, the, the zoning of the site has always been residential in some capacity, 
it was zoned to that, in, it was zoned residential development in 1990, and then it was rezoned to single family residential in 2019. We did some analysis for our comp plan. The first policy that we looked at is 1.13, which deals with commercial nodes. Uh, we found that it's approximately 1,300 feet uh, west of the nearest commercial node, which is Pine Island Road and Chiquita Boulevard. Uh, the surrounding properties do have the existing Pine Island Road future land use classification. Uh, staff finds that the site is part of a commercial node. However, it doesn't really have the access that you would like to see from a commercial node site. We also looked at policy 1.14, which is our eight commercial siting guidelines. Staff found that the site is consistent with one of the guidelines, which is major intersection. It's partially consistent with another guideline, which, which is compactness. Uh, we found that the sites are generally rectangular and are around 10,000 square feet. However, it's not consistent with six commercial siting guidelines, which is adequate depth, integration, assembly, intrusion, access, and ownership pattern. Uh, staff notes that the guidelines are not meant to determine approval or denial. They're mostly just to give guidance on whether a property is suited for commercial development or not. We also looked at this according to our economic development master plan. Uh, we found that the amendment is neither supported or in conflict with the master plan. And lastly, we have a recommendation. Uh, we find that we recommend approval of the proposed large scale future land use map amendment request. And the Planning and Zoning Commission heard this at their January hearing, and they also recommended for this to be approved by a vote of seven to one. I stand by for any further comments or questions. Thank you. Now open up public input. Anyone wishing to speak to Ordinance 2-20, please come forward. Seeing none, public input's closed. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. To approve transmittal. Okay, second. Any discussion? Madam City Clerk, call the roll. Oh, sorry, hold on. Councilmember Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Um, now here we go again, chopping up a big piece of land with potential commercial ability into more building lots, which we really, really don't need. I mean, we've got, what, 44,000 empty building lots in the city right now? Um, I'm not going to uh, agree to this. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just we're, we're chopping up. You know, these last three or four weeks, we're just chopping up big pieces of land into more little building lots, and it doesn't make sense. And especially there, it's, it's a huge commercial area. Um, there are homes, granted, I mean, Sandoval is right fairly close to it. Um, you've got uh, commercial businesses on the north side of Pine Island Road. South side, I, I know that there were some interested. I don't know what's happened. There was going to be a Walmart going in along there somewhere. I'm not sure what's happening with that right now. But um, still, it just makes no sense to be chopping up a large piece of land that could potentially be used for commercial use, which we desperately need, to put in another bunch of homes that we don't need. So I'm going to vote no. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Zerlard? Thank you. When Mr. Uh, 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 Boye made the, the comment that, and pardon my voice, this was a calibration, I would call it a mistake. Uh, I believe that this, and, and Chad will correct me if I'm incorrect, but I believe this was initially zoned as single family residential to begin with. And during the, the LUDR process, there was an inadvertent uh, labeling of this property as commercial. Is that correct, Chad? The property has retained single family zoning of some form since 1990. Uh, previously, the future land use of this was Pylon Road District. Uh, back in the early 2000s, the Pylon Road Master Plan was adopted. Um, Part of that was basically anything that was within two to 3,000 feet of Pineland Road. The future land use was amended to Pineland Road District. However, the zoning was never changed back on this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the idea was to perhaps spur some sort of assemblage along these areas if they didn't, if they were sort of chopped up. These properties are, are 10,000 square feet, so it's not like they're already subdivided. They're not assembled into anything larger. It's had the Pineland Road District future land use classification since 2002, and there really hasn't been any sort of assemblage or commercial interest or development, uh, so to speak. The zoning was changed back in 2019 as, far as part of the LDC update. Uh, staff was sort of uh, de uh, deciding whether or not to keep it as residential or change the land use back to single family <laughs> residential. And instead, we, it was up to the council, and the council's direction was to change this to single-family zoning or single-family land use. 
Councilmember Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I, I want to thank you because now you've presented us an opportunity for it to remain commercial. Um, I, I understand what you're saying, and you know we've been trying to fix mistakes, but this mistake has put a commercial label on it. Um, you want to put it back what it used to be. Well, no, let's leave it where it is. I think. I mean, you guys know, we all know, and most people in this room know that we need commercial area. Now, you say it's already subdivided, but if it's got the correct land use, it'll be easier to assemble a land. Mr. Williams, uh, Council Mayor Vince Cotero, we're saying the opposite. The land use mi mistake was made when Pine Island Road District was put on this property. This was subdivided for single family residential, and at the map that uh, Chad showed you, and even on the aerial, it shows large swaths of land in the middle and on the west side and some on the east side. The error wasn't made with the zoning. The error was made with the land use. This is residentially platted property that would, it's highly unlikely that people are going to start putting small commercial units next to these residential areas. And people have building permits that are actually pending uh, in that area right now. And if it was developing, commercial, it, it's not the kind of commercial that the city is asking Ricardo to look for. In the, in the middle of a residential area like that, you might get a Domino's Pizza or a Dollar General. I can't say it in strong enough terms that this is a mistake to keep the land use as commercial. All right, I, I'm obviously the, you're the expert, I'm not, but um, it, it just sticks in my craw when I'm approving more <coughs> building lots when we already have so many, we because have thousands of them. Be, and, and please keep in mind, and I, I hope this increases your comfort level, there are many other instances like this where the land use and zoning don't match and you're gonna see more of them come before you. And we wouldn't bring anything before you that is not consistent with where our economic development office is going and where um, Mr. Zerlag wants us to go and where the economic development master plan has gone. These, these are lots that need to be reconciled in order with the pattern of development, and in this case, it's just not commercial. In others where it's mixed, you've made it clear you don't want to go from commercial to residential. And in areas where it's, where it's a mixed use and that's appropriate, we hear, your recommend we hear your direction on that. This is not one of those areas. All right, I give. Motion to approve. I think we had a motion already. Okay. But thank you anyway. Second. <laughs> I think we had a second too. Any other discussion? Madam City Clerk, call the roll. Coviello? Aye. Gunter? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Williams? Aye. Kariosha? Aye. Costin? Aye. All ayes. Motion carried. Thank you. Let's go on Ordinance 3 20. Madam City Clerk, please read the title. Ordinance 3 20. An ordinance of the City of Cape Coral, Florida, amending Chapter 2, Article 6, Division 2, Firefighter Pension, to implement the conclusive cancer presumption established by Section 112.1816 Florida Statute and the rebuttal disease presumptions under Sections 112.18, 112.181, and 175.231 Florida statutes, creating section 2-122.7D of the city code relating to in line of duty death benefits, amending section 2-122.8B of the city code relating to in line of duty disability benefits, providing for inclusion in the code, providing for severability, providing for a repealer, and providing for an effective date. Thank you. Mayor, members of the commission, my name is Adam Levinson. This is my first time here before. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Klausner, Kaufman, Jensen, Levinson. I'm filling in for my partner who couldn't be here today. I'll point out that there are several trustees on the firefighter board who are here tonight. Uh, so they may be able to answer questions that I may not, but I think it's a fairly straightforward presentation for you. And I'm mainly here to answer any questions and just tee it up. 
So as, as was described from the title, the Florida legislature last session put in place, and it took them a couple years to do it because uh, other states have done it and Florida finally caught up. And it's a cancer presumption. And the reason why, as we can all expect, is that firefighters are exposed to all kinds of chemicals and fumes, et cetera. So once the science established that there is a higher incidence of cancer, and there's about 18 cancers that were documented through epidemiological studies that went through rigorous testing, et cetera. So the legislature caught up, and now these are set in to the Florida statute. So the question here today is to memorialize that, and really we're keeping it as simple as we can, and I, we are the attorney for the pension board, the fire pension board. This only applies to firefighters. And uh, the quick answer is what we're doing in two places following the statute is we are providing that we're gonna track by reference, so rather than taking all the detailed language of the statute and pasting it into the city code, we're just putting it in with a reference in the two places where it would apply, and the quick answer is on death benefits and on disability benefits, so if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer those questions. Because it's a pension ordinance, it requires an impact statement from an actuary. So we have that impact statement in the file. And I'll point out to you that there's also another pension ordinance, a separate pension ordinance, which is the next item. So again, I'm here to answer any questions. And I'm a pleasure to have my colleagues with me today uh, who, who do this on a regular basis. And I salute them for their service. Thank you. I'll now open up public input on Ordinance 3-20. Anyone wishing to speak, please come forward. Seeing none, the public input's closed. Is there a motion to approve Ordinance 3-20? So moved. Approved. Second. 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 Councilmember Williams, discussion? Um, thank you again, Mayor. I'm talking a lot tonight, huh? Um, the state's already passed this, so they preempted any chance that we had to not pass it. But, um, Basically, all we're doing tonight is adjusting our ordinances to follow the state statute. I love short answers. Exactly, okay. sir. Okay. No, good, thanks. Good. Any other discussion? All right, we have a motion. We have a second. Madam City Clerk, call the roll. Coviello? Aye. Gunter? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Williams? Aye. Cariosha? Aye. Costin? Aye. All ayes. Motion carried. Thank you. Let's go on ordinance 4-20. Madam City Clerk, please read the title. Ordinance 4-20, an ordinance of the City of Cape Coral, Florida, amending Chapter 2, Article 6, Division 2, Firefighter Pension, to increase the maximum pension, amending Section 2-122.6C of the City Code relating to benefit amounts and eligibility, providing for inclusion in the code, providing for severability, providing for a repealer, and providing for an effective date. Thank you. So continuing with the second firefighter pension ordinance, again, Adam Levinson for the record from Klausner, Kaufman, Jensen, Levinson. And uh, here what we have is consistent with what had been negotiated and was what's already in the plan. And the way it works, and different cities and different unions do different things, but right now we have a cap on benefits. <coughs> and the way the cap works is that if the plan is at least 80% funded, and that's recognized not just in Florida, but around the country as being a healthy plan. So as long, and there are many plans in Florida, I'll point out, that aren't anywhere close to 80%. So as long as you're at 80%, then the benefit can increase because there's a cap. And what is the current cap? And the answer is if you look at the ordinance, the current cap is set forth in paragraph 2-122.6 sub C, uh, when it gives you what the cap is, and what this now provides, which was already negotiated, and we're trying to just memorialize it in the ordinance so there's no confusion, everybody should be clear what the cap would increase, and the deal is that as long as we are 80% funded in every year, then the benefit cap would increase by 1%. So here, all we're doing is memorializing that because in the most recent valuation, we exceeded the 80% threshold, so the benefit increases by the 1%, and the, the board's preference the way the board would prefer to do it, which we think is the best practice, is again, next year, provided we're at least 80%, provided at least we trigger the 1% increase to come back to you and put that in again, so that way you have a paper trail demonstrating how the, the benefit has proceeded over time. And I'll admit, uh, to put it on the table, that uh, you know, this is a difference, uh, an area where reasonable minds can disagree, but the pension board's view is that this is the best practice so that the plan memorializes, there's no confusion for members, no confusion for for taxpayers, it's right for up front in the ordinance so you can see exactly as the cap increases, which is the hope, every year over time as we get closer and closer to 100% funding. I'm Thank happy you. to take any questions. Thank you. I'll now open up public input. Anyone wishing to speak on ordinance 
4-20, please come forward. Seeing none, the public input's now closed. Motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll give a second to Just entertain discussion. the discussion. Okay, Mr. S Mr. Zerlach. Thank you. Just want to provide some more background than what the attorney indicated, and that is about five years ago, we had uh, gone on a quest to uh, save the finances of the city of Cape Coral, and it was really two-pronged. One was revenue diversification, which we implemented, and the second, and a very important one, uh, involved a partnership between the city and virtually all of the employees. It was pension reform, and with the cap that we negotiated, saves us about $185 million over the next 20 years. We've already had this for about 20 years. So this was something that we had negotiated with the fire department that when the uh, actuarial valuation indicated 80% funding, as long as there was an 80% or more funded, we would uh, increase the cap uh, about 1% 1, 1 a year. And again, pardon my voice. And so just wanted to provide the background that this is, uh, this is something that involved pension reform that saved us about $185 million. And it is, as the attorney mentioned, uh, it's contained in our existing collective bargaining agreement with the fire department. And this ordinance uh, memorializes that. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have a, a concern, I guess, about the level of detail, Mr. City Manager, in terms of the numbers. I mean, are we gonna be able to manage that? Like, who's gonna manage that in the ordinance? Well, there's a pension board that, uh, uh, that's responsible for the uh, distribution of, of, of payments that works uh, con in conjunction with our HR department and our finance department. And uh, there's an actuarial valuation by uh, our actuarial firm, and fo which is Foster and Foster. And every year, they'll indicate what percent our, uh, our fire department's pension is funded. And if it's 80% or more, There'll be an ordinance with, for a 1% <coughs> increase, increasing the cap by 1% from the previous year. If that valuation slips below 80%, then the number that you have in the, in, in the previous year essentially will be frozen. And then, and, but, but your pension board, the pension board and our staff will manage that, the HR staff will yes, manage uh, that? The, the exact mechanics, again, I think uh, would be the, the pension board is responsible for uh, the, the, the pension benefits that are negotiated and approved by city council and the actual payments to the retirees are administered either through a, a mm -hmm. in conjunction with finance or payroll, uh, and uh, we'll make sure that happens. We have thousands of people that are currently receiving a pension. Okay, do you feel that it's necessary to have that level of detail in the ordinance? Yes. You do? Yes, ma'am, I do. Uh, again, I'll be, uh, this, this will be the last year that I see this as city manager. Mm -hmm. The, uh, our, our fire chief is new. There's no indication what a great job uh, that Ryan's doing, how long he's going to stay in, in, in Cape Coral. We have a turnover in, in, in various departments. And if this comes up every year as part of an actuarial valuation, we'll know, and most importantly, city council will know every year whether that threshold is met at 80% or more or is not met. And so from my perspective, nothing will be slide through the cracks if, if that's my concern that is just that level of detail and knowing how many ordinances we have and just us having to remember that or not have that brought forward to us is just a concern that I had when I read it. I spoke with our actuary today and he agrees that the detail would be beneficial. Okay. Thank you. For that writing, I don't know if I have it or not yet. But. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Cosden. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. So, John, the, the process that you described would happen without this ordinance, correct? This ordinance is, can yeah. you convince me? Because right now I'm not convinced that we need this ordinance because it sounds like everything you're describing can already be done based on the collective bargaining agreement. Well, I believe the, uh, uh, and I'll defer to the city attorney. I, I think we have, to, I, well, I believe that we have to have a, uh, uh, an ordinance that mirrors the labor contract language and um, this is the first time that we've actually had a uh, threshold where we are more than 80% actuarially funded, which is great news. A lot of systems are, are much less than 80%. And so again, in the negotiation process to get the reform, to get the cap into, in there to begin with, we negotiated that, well, if we become that sound in, in, in this system so that we're 80% or more funded, we'll increase the, the cap that we negotiated by 1% uh, by per year for every year. If that cap, 
uh, or if the, the funding liability is such that it's not 80% funded, then you'll have the exact number, as will the, the payroll department, to know that number is frozen. Does that's, do we need an ordinance to give us a number that could be just stored by finance? I, I'm just confused as to why we need an actual ordinance, and ordinance is serious. And the existing ordinance already says this is where we're starting, and then we add 1% as needed. So I just, I'm, I'm not understanding why we need to amend it. Right. Again, my, my role as manager is, a little, is, and, and I apologize for not giving you a great answer, is, is a little high, more high level than that. I negotiated the, the cap, and I said that essentially if you have, you be in the, uh, the fire department, and if we can make uh, you know, your contributions and whatever is needed to become actually funded, if that's 80% or more, we'll increase that cap by 1%. And the ordinance was brought forward by the, uh, the pension board. And again, the, the language that you have is very close, if not identical, to the language in, in the ordinance that we have in the, the, labor, the labor agreement. And so in terms of mechanics, I believe this would be a good way to, to proceed. So that again, yes, every year, just like you get an actuarial valuation every year from our actuaries, they'll say, well, you know, the, you're 80% funded or 85% funded, you'll now, this now makes the eligibility for the cap to be raised in the fire department by, by 1%. And, and again, when we negotiated this, we were looking at pension reform and we wanted to save money uh, for, the, uh, for the city. And not to be redundant, but $185 million is a lot of money to save. And this was part and parcel of that. If the, uh, the pension board feels that they have a, a better zone of comfort, having this come in annually as management, that, that's fine with us. Please, yes. Sure, agreeing with the manager. And it's, it's a good conversation to have because there is no right answer. It's what's comfortable in, in the city. And uh, I'll add to you that, uh, agreeing with what was said, the, the actuary, let me give a little bit, 30 seconds of background. So the actuary is the number cruncher that specializes in liabilities. And I, I like to joke with the actuaries, it takes more training and certification and exams to become an enrolled actuary than it does to become an attorney. So the actuaries are professional number crunchers. And uh, the average person, uh, present company included, uh, you read evaluation, there's a lot of detail in there and you can very easily oversee it. So the beauty of this approach is we're being completely transparent. You don't have to delve into and dig into the details of complex valuations. It's clear for everybody. It creates a track record of effective dates and uh, that's, that's about the transparency. So uh, thank you, unless there are any other questions. No, thank okay. you, I'm good. Madam City Attorney. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that everyone has a zone of comfort. In no way since the time that we entered into this uh, collective bargaining agreement has the ordinance not reflected the pension reform that the city manager is referring to. It has, since that time, it has said in there that this 1% uh, increase will be occurring. So I don't want anybody to think that we have been somehow doing a calculation based on a collective bargaining agreement that is not memorialized and has not been memorialized in the um, in the ordinance. So that's, that's clear. We've been doing that. Uh, the actuary that Mr. Levinson refers to has been presumably doing that, crunching the numbers and doing that. And we have gotten to a point where we have reached that funding level. And as you can see, the proposed ordinance, when the city manager says the language in the ordinance matches the language in the collective bargaining agreement, yes, it does. It, it has been matching it. So the specific language that's being added today and, and reasonable parties may differ, okay? So there's no one, as, as Mr. Levinson said, there is no one right answer. This ordinance is saying effective October 1st, 2019, this 1% increase occurred. So as you can see, we're already looking backward at effective October 1st, 2019, this occurred. So what this ordinance is doing is making sure that that um, calculation is reflected in it. And whether or not you choose to reflect the calculation in the ordinance, that's all you're, you would be doing. If you, if you approve it tonight, rest assured the calculation would continue to occur regardless. But it's really a question for how council wants to address it. There is no, as Mr. Levinson said, right or wrong answer to it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> so my understanding is the calculation continues on indefinitely if we don't adopt this new terminology. But I have a question in regards to if we do adopt it tonight, 
does that then make it necessary to adopt this every year hereafter? So next year, do we see it reading effective October 1st, 2020, the maximum benefit, blah, 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 to such an amount and so forth. And then every single year we need to have another uh, ordinance. If you reach the funding level. If we reach the funding level in excess of the 80%. Is that correct? Stated in yes. the original here. Yes, that would be correct because right. when you reach the funding level again, you need to do the calculation and increase it by the one percent again. So and then we have to this have will be outdated again. when that happens. And we have to look at this again. <laughs> Is it possible to um, um, put this information out in a letter instead of making us look at an ordinance year after year after year after year when there is a, a funding in excess of eighty percent? Can we do it by letter? Can we communicate and still maintain our transparency? Because <laughs> obviously the actuarials do the calculation every year. Um, why not do this in a letter? Here's our calculation for this year and disseminate that to the council as a matter of information. If I may. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't report earlier. Mark Murth, Cape Coral Professional Firefighters. I represent the labor union. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit, uh, we might have had some misunderstanding. We thought what tonight's ordinance was, was basically to get in line with what we negotiated, but that every year you would not necessarily have to come back and revisit this ordinance. What would happen is, similar to what you're saying, uh, Councilwoman Welsh, is that in our summary plan description, you would continue to see if we were 80% funded, um, that number to go up. Uh, so that's kind of what we expected, because certainly we have concerns, you know, if you voted no, I, I mean, what does that mean? You know, ultimately it's pre-negotiated, it's already set in place. So while we understand from the pension attorney's um, side where they wanted to at least get this in, get it kind of like established, but from this point on, it wouldn't come up year after year after year. Um, but again, I just represent again. the labor it side. It could come up again, and it would require us to change the ordinance again, um, whereas, um, my opinion is that if we just kept it intact without adding these addition, this additional terminology, and perhaps you send a letter each year to the council members that states here's what the amount is now, then that would save paperwork and time, which are important resources. So I appreciate where you're coming from, um, sort of like why fix it, it's not broken, when we can do it by another method of communication besides through an ordinance. So I, you know, I appreciate what the fire department does. I appreciate your pensions. I support you 100%, but I'm all about minimizing paperwork and making the best use of resources. So um, with that, I'm, I'm through. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when I'm looking at that too, I'm seeing that every year, because you put numbers in here, it would have to come back for an approval to be added in again. And you know, I'm, I'm okay with it, but it's gonna have the same result whether that terminology is put in there or not. We're just outlining that we've met the 80% and this is the number. And although I think that's a good idea for council to have that information each year, I also agree with Councilmember Welsh that that can be just in the form of information that's provided. So the ordinance, if it stays the same, it's gonna have the net result. But why have to bring it back in front of us at a meeting just to keep adding those numbers in. Is there a specific reason why you guys like it that way or? Let me take the first stab at that question. So as I pointed out out front, this is an area where reasonable minds can disagree and it, it has to do with what kind of level of detail and transparency do you want in the ordinance. So our office's view in, in this example is that at least, very, at the very least, in the first year when we're over the 80% cap, which is, a good, which is good news, establish what that increase was and by the way, on second reading or in future years, you could always, when we come back to you, hopefully it's again next year and you're exactly right that if it satisfies the 80%, we're going to come back next year uh, unless you decide today not to adopt the ordinance because your your view may, might be that it's unnecessary but something you could do in the future is you could say uh, you know we've, we've established what it is the first time which is this this example this go around and in future years you could say uh, you know and uh, shall increased uh, as certified uh, in the valuation which shall be provided to the city so there are all kinds of ways you could do it in the future but our view is at least in the first year get it in there and uh, you can decide in the future if you want to do it every year but that would be the approach of the 
the board, which is all about full transparency. But with that said, um, I will concede that it is not something that's obligatory because uh, it's already built into the CBA, the contract. Mr. Zerlach. Thank you. And again, I just want the, uh, the mayor and council to have all the information that I have. And at 4.59 today, uh, I received an email from our actuary, uh, Doug Lozen, and uh, it's four paragraphs long. I'll, I'll, I'll read fast. It says, per our discussion, the maximum benefit cap increases by 1% every year. The funded ratio in the latest actuarial valuation exceeds 80%. In the event the funded ratio falls below 80%, the maximum benefit freezes at the amount in place with the 1% annual adjustment taking effect when the ratio again exceeds 80%. This is what was discussed during negotiations and how we costed out our impact. Since the funded ratio reported in the 10-1-2018 valuation exceeded 80%, the maximum benefit is now 1% higher, i.e. an increase from $95,000 per year to $95,950 per year. This, this I think is what, I, what, what you, I'd like you to hear. The pension board, board attorney, and Foster and Foster are all on the same page that the firefighters pension ordinance should codify the cap every time it increases. Accordingly, we recommend an update to the ordinance reflecting the current maximum benefit. And so that's, so you have essentially the, the pension board, the board itself, Foster and Foster, and I'll, I'll throw in city management agreeing that this should be codified every year just because again, it's transparent. We think it's a best practice. The actuarial valuation report will say you need to go to city council or you don't need to go to city council because the, the, uh, the funded liability is below 80%, so it stays the same for a year. But again, that's <coughs> you, folks. I just want you to know what I, what I learned 10 minutes ago. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Gunter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, can, you, can you tell me why it's so important to have the actual dollar amount in the ordinance versus just having the same formula where you're going to come up with the same answer anyway. You're, you're correct, Mr. Gunter, that it's going to be the same answer anyway. But as the manager pointed out, it's all about the transparency. The city code is available for anyone who wants to find the city code. You go into the pension plan and you see it. It's up front. It's clear. There's no dispute about what it was. It creates a paper trail also. So you see what the effective dates were, when it increased. You can see the benefit amounts, the, the cap increase. It, you, you can see the history. So it creates that, uh, that institutional knowledge. And as the, the trustees will be able to tell you, uh, you know, they, they serve a term, they're elected to the board, and then you have city appointees. But you get turnover on the boards, you get turnovers in staffs, you get turnover in the city staff, not just the pension staff. So it's a way of memorializing and creating that track record. So that's the reason why our office thinks it's the best practice. But again, I, I defer to the wisdom of the, of the, of the commission, and uh, this is an area where reasonable minds can disagree. Hello, everybody. Uh, Jason Spinner, trustee for the Pension Fire Board. This idea really comes about the work that we would do today isn't necessarily about today, but it's about in the future. As the city managers pointed out, the number can be raised, it can freeze, it can raise, it can freeze. We're not talking about today. We're talking about five, seven, ten years in the future. We had to start. We had to stop. When did it happen? If we go and compound 1% over time, especially with starts and stops, the standard deviation of that number will be different. An actuary, when they crunch their numbers, goes out seven decimal places. Numbers can be skewed. This number that we have is used by more than just one party. It's used for you and your function. It's used by city manager. It's used by finance. It's used by the labor union in negotiations. And it's used by us to, when we look at our employees and say, when you work for us, here will be your benefit. I could show them on an actual legal document that shows the history, that shows exactly what the number is, so there is no shadow of a doubt. I would hope to think that it wouldn't cause much more work than what we already do. We would come in here once a year, we could just put it on paper, and we would move on with our day. Um, that was basically the history of where this came from, is to have this important function of math documented down where we could refer to it in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, could I uh, finish? <coughs> there. Um, I can understand having the documentation and uh, where each year you take a look at it. Uh, something as significant as your retirement. I can understand how important that may be. Uh, I think that the formula, you're still going to get to the same answer like we've talked about here today. But if this makes the uh, pension board more comfortable, I personally don't have a problem with it. Um, you know, kind of what you 
uh, stated as far as looking into the future or looking in the past. You know, 20 years or 10 years from now, we may want to look back. This may be a little easier to do that if we had this type of system in place. Uh, so because, because of that, I, I would support it. That's all I have. Thank you. In addition, yeah, I like the fact that there's a paper trail and that there's some accountability to what's happened. I also agree with the fact that council is going to change at some point. You know, hierarchy is going to change at some point. So to bring this forward on an annual basis is not the worst thing for them to see what's going on and what the pension is going to be, whether you hit the 80 percent or you didn't hit the 80 percent. I think that's a good, a good uh, passing on of information as we go along. Councilmember Cosden. Thank you. I'm still not convinced, but I'm going to defer to the judgment of the pension board and the, was it, what was the name of the firm that made the suggestion, Foster and Foster? Foster and Foster. Okay. I'll just defer to that and I'll support this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? All right. I think we had a motion and we had a second, correct? Yes, sir. Madam City Clerk, call the roll. Coviello. Aye. Gunter. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Welsh. Aye. Williams. Aye. Kariosha. Aye. Costin. Aye. All ayes. Motion carried. Thank you. This time I think we'll just take a 10 minute break. <coughs>
bring the meeting back into order. Let's go on to ordinance 6-20. Madam City Clerk, please read the title. Ordinance 6-20, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $35 million in principal amount of a note to refund a portion of the city's outstanding gas tax revenue bonds, federally taxable Build America bonds, direct payment. Series 2010B, in order to achieve debt service savings for the city, providing for a covenant to budget and appropriate legally available non ad valorem revenues to pay the principal of redemption premium, if any, and interest on the note, providing for the rights of the holder of such note and providing severability at an effective date. Thank you. Chris? I discussed earlier this is a refunding of some 2010 Build America bonds. They were used for the widening of Del Prado and for the widening of Santa Barbara back in 2010. We've had the opportunity to refund these at a lower interest rate, not extend the maturity date, and save about $4.7 million in the process. Um, I've got a presentation here for you. If you want me to run through it, I can. Or if you have specific questions, we can address it that way. But basically, what you, what you have is just details of, of how we came about this. Um, why we made the decisions we made about refinancing the bonds. Um, we'll get into the, the resolution in a moment about the, the bank that we went with, but we received eight proposals uh, to, to refinance these, and we'll talk about who the, uh, the winner was, uh, TD Bank. Uh, we, we locked in a 1.99% interest rate, um, and again, we did not extend the maturity date of these bonds. Uh, we talked about earlier how much were we refunding of the original 39 million. We're, we're refunding 33 million of that. In addition to that, we had some money in escrow that we've had to keep in place as part of the bond covenants. So we're able to use that to pay down what we have to to borrow to refinance those. So that was a that was a good thing for us. It was about 3.3 million dollars was that. Uh, so tonight we're asking you to adopt a resolution. Select TD Bank as the lender, and this is the final public uh, hearing for the ordinance to authorize the loan. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now open up public input. Anyone wishing to speak on Ordinance 6 20? Seeing none, public input's closed. <coughs> is there a motion to approve? So moved. A second? Second. Any discussion? Madam City Clerk, call the roll. Coviello? Aye. Gunter? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Williams? Cariosha? Aye. Pasden? Aye. Six ayes, motion carried. Thank you. Let's go on resolution 29-20. Uh, Madam City Clerk, please read the title. <coughs> Resolution 29-20, a resolution of the City of Cape Coral, Florida, accepting a proposal of TD Bank N.A. to provide the city with a loan in order to refund a portion of the city's outstanding gas tax revenue bonds, federally taxable Build America bonds, direct payment. Series 2010B, in order to achieve debt service savings for the city. Approving the form of a loan agreement, authorizing the issuance of a promissory note pursuant to such loan agreement in the aggregate principal amount of not exceeding $31 million in order to evidence such loan, authorizing the repayment of such note from a covenant to budget and appropriate legally available non ad valorem revenues, delegating certain authority to the mayor, city manager, and other officers of the city for the authorization, execution, and delivery of the loan agreement, promissory note, and various other documents with respect thereto, authorizing the execution and delivery of an escrow deposit agreement and the appointment of an escrow agent thereto, and providing an effective date. Thank you. Chris? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I stand by for any questions you may have on this resolution. Thank you. I'll now open up public input. Anyone wishing to speak on resolution 29-20, please come forward. Seeing none, public input's closed. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Madam City Clerk, call the roll. Coviello? Aye. Gunter? Aye. 
Nelson? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Williams? Ariosha? Aye. Costin? Aye. Six ayes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Chris. Nice job. Thank you. Okay, let's go on. Resolution 25-20. Madam City Clerk, please read the title. Resolution 25-20. A resolution affirming, affirming with modifications, or reversing the decision of the hearing examiner rendered on September 12, 2019 in S.E. Hex Order 6-2019 that granted amendments to the site and landscaping plans associated with Resolution 108-15 which granted a special exception for an automotive service establishment use in order to operate a car wash in the South Cape downtown <clears throat> zone on real property described as lots 1 through 7 and 24 through 30, block 363, unit 7, property located at 1707 Cape Coral Parkway East, providing an effective date. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Vince Katera, Community Development Director. And if we can go to Elmo here, I have a photograph, okay. Um, as the Council is aware from uh, discussing with staff earlier and reading your background packet, we're here to talk about an appeal that the staff filed uh, against the decision that was rendered by the hearing examiner for the downtown car wash located on the north side of Cape Coral Parkway, just east of Del Prado Boulevard South. Uh, as the council is aware, the downtown car wash was approved um, by the city council oh. based on uh, an appeal. Five, Vince, one second, please. This is yes. a uh, quasi-judicial hearing. So anyone wishing to speak or provide testimony must be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> continue. Thank you, Mayor. An appeal uh, hearing was held in uh, 2015 and the decision of the Board of Zoning Adjustments and Appeals was overturned and the car wash was allowed uh, via special exception. In 2019, I should say that that special exception was approved with a plethora of conditions, and the one we're talking about tonight is the buffering. And I know your, your, uh, the photographs in your packet are a little bit better than what we've shown up here, but the general uh, idea will be seen on the, uh, the next uh, photograph that I place on the, on the overhead. Uh, one of the conditions dealt with uh, the creation of a wall that would be placed that I'm showing here. You can see it behind the trellis, and the wall has grills in it, and there's two uh, stub outs or wing walls on each side. One is adjacent to the office on the eastern side, and one is adjacent to the dog wash, which is located on the western side of the property. So that would be here, and the office would be here where I'm pointing to. Um, originally, the um, condition that was imposed by the council created a uh, buffering to be placed, a three-foot stem wall. The rest of the wall would go up six feet more, and it would um, be a total of nine feet, and there would be the other attributes that I talked about a moment ago, including uh, lattice work or a trellis. Uh, in 2019, as I stated, the applicant, or excuse me, the property owner came forward and filed an application to the hearing examiner to amend the special exception. And the application was approved to eliminate the buffering with the exception of the stem wall, uh, but there was uh, an, uh, an allotment of some additional buffering and landscaping that would be placed in accordance with the stem wall. The rest of the buffering, if you will, would be eliminated, and that would be all of the entire wall, the trellises and the um, grill, if you will, with, within the, the wall structure itself, which couldn't stand by itself if the, if the wall came down. Uh, the staff appealed, and the primary reason for the appeal was due to the fact that the condition was imposed by the city council back in 2015. Now, the owners and their representatives acted completely within the confines of the code that they could recommend or excuse me request a change to a condition imposed 
um, by the council through the proper procedure, and that is through the hearing examiner. They replaced the hearing examiner replaced the board of zoning uh, adjustments and appeals uh, several years ago. But we felt that, that this, since this was such uh, an, an intense agenda item that was discussed over four years ago, that the council should have a say in that, and uh, the council was notified of our actions. Uh, Mr. Zerlag and I met with um, the owner of the property and his builder and his consultants, and we've had some very productive discussions. Uh, I met on site twice with the representatives, and Mr. Zerlag uh, joined us at one of, of the two meetings. And our uh, recommendation to you tonight, and we'll go over the legal logistics in a minute, and Linda Miller will uh, make a presentation on behalf of her clients. And this one shows a little bit better because it's not as dark. And this is an animated film, uh, or uh, this, this doesn't exist right now. This is a, a photograph that was, what's uh, animated is not the proper word. What do they do when they? Photoshopped. Uh, Photoshop. Thank you. I couldn't think of the, the word. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm too old for this stuff. I, I can't remember now. Um, what you see here is a photograph of what it would look like if the condition that we're recommending to you tonight is implemented, and that would be a retention of stem walls east and west and an elimination of the um, of six feet of the nine-foot wall, and the stem wall would, would remain. You can see that here, the east of this automobile and buffering, and there's also, I'll go over the condition that we're asking to be re uh, amended, uh, would in include a little bit of buffering. So what we're saying is, in a nutshell, we appealed the decision. And usually when these things happen, we come to you, it's an all or none. You've heard at least several appeals, uh, at least three since I've been here, maybe, maybe four. And legal staff prepares on most, in most cases, two resolutions, one affirming the appeal and one denying the appeal. So it's an affirmation or an overturn. In this case, you're dealing with the decision of the hearing examiner, or the hex, as we say, the slang term. But there's a third resolution with you this evening, and that is a modified order or final decision, which is what the order is, of the hex. And that one is a joint request by staff and the applicant. And as I stated, this was uh, went all the way up to city management, and it was our uh, recommendation. It's our recommendation to you um, that we uh, recommend jointly to you the revised condition. And the highlights of it are that what I just stated, that a portion of the wall would, uh, of the existing nine foot wall, it's approximately 102 linear feet in length on Cape Coral Parkway between the office building and the dog wash um, be cut to three, which we're calling the stem wall, for lack of a better term. And that the wing walls um, are not, that are nine feet high, one is 16, uh, four in, um, 16, four inches, and the other one's 10, three. So they're nine feet high, but those are the dimensions of each one. They're not the same size. Uh, they would remain. And that uh, the two existing trellises and other architectural features, I mentioned the grills, uh, would, would be eliminated within that nine foot section, and the property owner would plant 36 cocoa plums at a minimum height of 24 inches in a seven inch container. That is in the resolution that modifies the HEX's order, and that's what we're asking for. So uh, I may have left out some important legal implications, but I'm gonna ask um, our city attorney to, to discuss those with you if she believes that that's appropriate at the time, she believes appropriate if it's now or after uh, Linda's presentation. So this is a, an unusual appeal hearing. It's the first one we've done like this because Usually there hasn't been an agreement, and we come in, we give you a presentation, the other side gives a presentation, and then there's cross-examination and so forth. Uh, we don't anticipate that this evening because of what uh, we have discussed with the applicant. So if there are any questions at this point, I'll pause before either uh, Dolores makes some remarks or Linda comes up and, and uh, makes her presentation. 
I don't see any questions, Mr. Okay. Patera, but let's uh, open up the public hearing and if anyone wishing to speak on resolution 25-20, please come forward. Good evening, Linda Miller, Senior Planner with Avalon Engineering, representing 1707 Cape Coral LLC on Appeal 19-3, Resolution 2520 for the downtown or car wash on Cape Coral Parkway. We appreciate staff's time and their willingness to consider a compromise to their appeal, and we are in agreement to leave the wing walls at nine feet as staff presented. Um, the owners, Jay and Troy Montepettit, which are here this evening, have met with city staff on several occasions after obtaining approval from the hearing examiner on September 12th. The hearing examiner approved a modification to the site plan and landscaping plan that was approved as part of the special exception use, which would allow this business to lower the existing wall between the dog wash building and the office building from nine feet to three feet. The owners and staff have agreed to a compromise and they would leave the two wing walls at nine foot high for over 16 feet next to the dog wash and over 10 feet next to the office building while lowering the remainder of the existing wall to three feet between the wing walls and adding the additional landscaping. We have prepared a PowerPoint presentation and reserve the right to present the presentation to city council if the council is not agreement with the compromise being brought forward this evening evening. At this time, I would like to ask Jay Montepettit to say a few words. Good evening, Mayor and uh, Council members. My name is Jay Montepettit, um, co-owner of the Downtowner Car Wash, along with my wife, Shelly, my son, Troy, and his wife, Kim. Um, we're a Ma and Pa type operation. We've uh, heavily invested in Cape Coral. We believe in Cape Coral. We care. Um, we, we donate to the, uh, and my remarks will be brief, uh, charity and schools and what have you. Um, I just want to make clear the reason this was brought forward on our behalf to begin with. We've been here for three years and we've lost money every, every year on that site. And not the, not the uh, accounting kind of money, hard money. Uh, we believe that this is a step that will help us. We believe in additional advertising which we've done, we, we have recently in the last year, we're involved in every kind of vending fest there is, the Art Fest, Bike Week, uh, Phil Deem's upcoming uh, charity show, the 8th at Modern Muscle at the Yacht Club, and, and we do three or four of these things a, a month in an effort to kind of get this thing going. Um, so I, I just want to conclude with, I'm, I would really commend the, the effort that uh, all have made on this path for this compromise. Uh, we, as, as mentioned previously, we had several meetings there, lots of phone conversations and those types of things. And it's really refreshing in an air where compromise almost doesn't exist anymore, anywhere. I don't mean just in the city of Cape Coral, uh, everywhere really. So I don't really have anything more. I want to thank uh, everybody and I'll stand by for any questions. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak during public input? Councilmember Gunter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, what I did the last few days as I went and uh, looked at the hearing examiner's uh, report, I actually uh, went back to the 2015 video when the uh, initial, I think Councilmember Williams was here then, uh, the initial uh, hearing was uh, for this establishment went back and looked at the hearing examiner's uh, video a few months ago uh, when this topic uh, was discussed. Um, in my opinion, I would have concurred with the hearing examiner uh, based on the facts that she stated in her report. But since the uh, city staff and the applicant have come to a mutual agreement that they both can uh, work with. I'll make a motion for approval on this ordinance with the modification that was stated uh, and the agreement, mutual agreement between both parties. Got a motion, right. I have a second? Second. Second. Okay, some other discussion, council member Williams. Thank you, mayor. Um, 2015, I was totally against this. The, uh, 
I've gone by there numerous times, and, and they keep the place orderly. They keep it clean, neat. Uh, it's not an eyesore, which I had kind of projected it would be. So uh, I have no problem with them being there. I do have one question, though. Um, somebody just stated that the D wall uh, used to be nine feet, now it's three. What happened to the other six? How did that come down? There was a section in the middle that was right from the beginning that was three feet where the monument sign is. Either side of that is the nine feet. Uh, we didn't take anything down. We built it as per plan and per agreement. Was that, was that your question, Councilman? Yeah, yeah. Well, it hasn't come down yet, sir. It hasn't come down? No, they, they were, they were um, uh, notified when we appealed that if they did that, it would be at their own risk. And they were very cooperative and they didn't, they didn't do anything. Okay. But, the wall is still exists. It still exists at nine feet. Yes, sir. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is just to clarify that the motion makers motion is to approve the resolution that um, would affirm the uh, hearing examiner order, the hex order, except as it's modified within that resolution. That's correct, with the mutual agreement between both parties. Yes. Thank you. Quick question. You had talked about 24-inch plantings. Are they designed to stay at 24 inches, or are they going to grow? The, the <coughs> landscaping? I'm sorry, sir. I didn't hear your question exactly. The, uh, you just said there would be some plantings. Yes. 24-inch, I forget the name of the plant. Cocoa plum. Cocoa plum. Do they stay at 24 inches, or do they get big? I don't know, but I, I bet you a soda, Linda knows, because she deals okay. with this all the time. Well, I'm just curious, and are they being planted along? <laughs> I mean, the idea here, obviously, is to get some open vision of what's there. Yes, uh, uh, we will keep them at the 36 inch where the wall is, but they do grow fast. They're one of the fastest growing shrubs in, in our area, and they're native to us, so they will get up to the height of the wall. But are they gonna, the, to block the view of what's inside that you want to attain or no? No, just they're going to go up just to the height of the three foot wall. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? All right. We have a motion. We have a second. Madam City Clerk, call the roll. Yes, Your Honor. Before I call roll, just as a procedural, can I have, oh, to, I have close to close the public? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I have to close uh, the public input. It's now closed. Thank we you. have a motion. We have a second. Any, there's no more discussion, so please call the roll. Coviello? Aye. Gunter? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Williams? Aye. Gariosha? Aye. Cosden? Aye. Seven ayes, motion carried. Okay, let's go on to introductions 9B. <coughs> uh, Madam City Clerk, please read the title and set the public hearing date. Resolution 18-20, a resolution providing for the vacation of Platt for a portion of the San Carlos Canal right-of-way and all underlying easements located adjacent to lots 38 through 39, block 98, Cape Coral, Unit 2, Part 2, providing for the vacation of Platt for public utility and drainage easements associated with lots 38 through 39, Block 98, Cape Coral, Unit 2, Part 2, property located at 4980 Seville Court, providing an effective date. The public hearing will be on February 10th, 2020. Thank you. So on Resolution 23-20, Madam City Clerk, please read the title. Set the public hearing date. Resolution 23-20, a resolution providing for the vacation of Platt for a portion of the Triton Canal right-of-way and all underlying easements located adjacent to lots 75 through 77, Block 101, Cape Coral, Unit 2, Part 2, providing for the vacation of Platt for public utility and drainage easements associated with lots 75 through 77, Block 101, Cape Coral, Unit 2, Part 2, property located at 5021 Sorrento Court, providing an effective date. The public hearing will be February 10th, 2020. Thank you. Let's go on Ordinance 9-20. Madam City Clerk, please read the title, set the public hearing date. 
Ordinance 9-20, an ordinance approving the sale of municipal surplus real property described as lots 21 through 22, block 5449, Cape Coral Unit 90, pursuant to section 2-155 of the City of Cape Coral Code of Ordinances, authorizing and directing the mayor and city clerk to execute a deed conveying the aforementioned surplus real property to Kimberly A. Panino and Jeffrey S. Panino, providing severability and an effective date. The public hearing will be February 10, 2020. Thank you. Go on, Ordinance 10-20. Madam City Clerk, please read the title. Set the public hearing date. <laughs> Ordinance 10-20, an ordinance approving the sale of municipal surplus real property described as lot 47, block 5257, Cape Coral, Spreader Waterway, Platte, pursuant to section 2-155 of the City of Cape Coral Code of Ordinances, authorizing and directing the mayor and city clerk to execute a deed conveying the aforementioned surplus real property to Michael J. Humphrey and Linda J. Humphrey, trustees of the Humphrey Living Trust, providing severability and an effective date. The public hearing will be February 10th, 2020. Thank you. Let's go on to item 10, unfinished business, uh, water quality update, Mr. Klingen. Yes, thank you, Paul Klingen, Public Works. Um, Lake Okeechobee, uh, the average historical is 14.66 uh, as of uh, January 31st, it's just below 13 feet. Last year at this time it was 12.67 feet. Uh, the Army Corps is releasing about uh, 700 CFS on average. Last year at this time it was over 3,000 CFS. Uh, there's been uh, uh, minimal blue-green allergy that has been uh, uh, observed at Davis Boat Ramp and the Franklin Lock, but there has been no toxins detected. And this past week, uh, red tide has been detected, uh, has not been, sorry, has not been detected uh, on shore in Lee County. So the water quality continues to uh, uh, look very good. And also, just as uh, I think uh, you have, were notified that uh, Public Works Environmental Resources is working with um, Professor Parsons from FGCU and Adam Schaefer from FAU, and we are uh, putting in four air monitoring stations, and that is to establish uh, background, and then if uh, blue-green algae comes back, the potential for the harmful algal blooms and that air toxins, but we have to get that background. So those are installed as we speak, and we'll be monitoring those. Any questions, discussion? Mr. Klingon, one of the things I want to ask about, I discussed this with the city manager today, and just to get some information, the mini reefs that people have been installing under their docks supposedly has the capacity of cleaning a lot of the water. And we talked a little bit about maybe somehow looking at if there was any places in the city that the city might be able to install those or then potentially maybe even come up with a program where we provide funds to maybe homeowners that would like to install some of those around the canals. So if we can just get some information on what do they really do and how much would they help? Yes, we can absolutely water, do that. The canals clean and then maybe down the road this council can discuss whether or not that's a program we want to take a look at and see if we want to do something along those lines. Yes, sir. We can look at that. Thank you. Any other follow-up items for council? Okay, let's go up, update discussion on the proposed HB 1011 vacation rentals. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council. Uh, Terry Hall and I recommended this item come before you this evening um, to the city manager's office and received approval for that. And we wanted to talk to you about the bill that several people mentioned this evening. Uh, our, our assumption is that they saw this on the agenda and, and wanted to talk about it. It's House Bill 1011, which has been heard by the Workforce Development and Tourism Subcommittee and w was approved by that committee and is now making its way through the process. Uh, we focused on the House bill because that one was analyzed before the, the companion uh, Senate bill. What you have in your packet 
uh, are a background of memos, at least four of them that the staff sent around the time we were preparing the ordinance for you, and it, uh, the, that proposed ordinance was adopted, excuse me, uh, sent to the council. You heard it at least twice in, 19, in um, ordinance 19-17. It was, it was heard uh, in 2017, and the uh, proposed bill is similar to what came forward to the legislature the last two years, but it was defeated. It wasn't approved, uh, never made its way to the governor's desk. Uh, this year, there's uh, e an equal amount of momentum uh, to move that from what we're hearing from our uh, lobbyists. Um, <clears throat> Terry's in touch with the lobbyists on a, a frequent basis. I'm also in, in touch with Nick Matthews from Becker and Polyakov, who is uh, one of our uh, lobbyists. And I also receive information from 1,000 Friends of Florida, the Florida Association of Counties, and the Florida League of Cities, and participate in conference calls. So we get information on the bills virtually every day, and this one, if not every day, every other day. Uh, what we proposed uh, for you to consider in the memorandum are the various points that were raised by the Florida League of Cities. And you can see that in the memorandum, and I'll just go over the highlights. Uh, this would preempt a, uh, local regulation of, of short-term rentals, inspection or licensing requirements. And the Florida League of Cities and other governmental groups believe that that's inappropriate, as we do, because it's a further intrusion of home rule authority. It would take away your ability to do that and any ordinances regarding those requirements that were adopted, I should say, after 2014 would be null and void. Now, before 2014 is still um, up for debate in the legal community, and there's lawyers that uh, um, participate in these conference calls, as well as the lawyers from the Florida League of Cities that discuss this. For example, our land development code contains the same language that the old one did, which states that you cannot rent your residence for less than seven days. The ordinance that we brought forward with you, uh, to you a few years ago, with uh, the backing of the stakeholder committee, it was really consensus, it wasn't unanimous, uh, because there were some citizens on the committee that did not uh, believe that the ordinance was appropriate was to allow short-term rentals of periods of less than seven days, but with restrictions. There would be mandatory inspections and follow-up. There would be a rental registration um, fee, and then there would also be uh, the database that would be created. And there's a lot of consulting firms that actually helped put these together. Uh, Mike I was uh, the, one of the major authors uh, of that ordinance with my staff. And we found out from one of the consulting firms that contacted us that there's and then there were at least 3,200 in the city that they got just from doing research. So that number is climbing. So we wanted to be able to make it legal, but with restrictions, because we don't have any restriction on it other than you've got a contract for less than seven days, you're illegal. So stop it. Well, what happens is when we get a complaint, we do respond, and it's very hard to prove that they rented it less than seven days, because if somebody had a contract and it was seven days, they can just stay for the weekend and work it out with the property owner that, well, I didn't stay seven days and go there. Now, what you can do and, and what we do do in the city, and the bill would not address that in a negative fashion, is to continue to impose regulations that you see fit on residential areas, but they're uniform. Setbacks, trash pickup, traffic control, um, <clears throat> parking requirements and any other requirements that you might impose upon a residential area. That wouldn't change, but what would, would change is they're basically saying you cannot limit someone's ability to rent their residential unit out. So uh, we have been standing down based on um, the action of the council a few years ago to not adopt the ordinance, and we are uh, waiting to see what <coughs> will happen from the state, but what we're coming to you before, uh, what we're coming before you tonight is to see if there's uh, consensus among the council members to make this a priority with our lobbyists and say we want you to do this um, with the legislature. There are a plethora of bills um, that may um, affect uh, the city. They're all under discussion. Um, 
uh, between staff and our lobbyists. We're talking to them constantly and telling them that we agree that this one should be opposed, this one should be supported, and so forth. This was at the top of our radar, which is why we bring it to you tonight. We have some other talking points that are in the cover memo, and as I said, the background contains um, <clears throat> four memorandums that we submitted in 2019 and a proposed draft of Ordinance 19-17. So with that, uh, unless Terry has anything to add, I'll turn it over for you for any questions. Any discussion? You know, I, I would say that, you know, that home rule has been under attack now for probably two years, and this is just another onslaught into that. And I would say that we most definitely want our lobbyists, I would support them you know, not allowing the state to regulate the vacation rentals is what it boils down to. And we want to maintain that ability here in our city of Cape Coral to be able to make the best decisions for our residents and our neighborhoods here. Very well. Any other discussions? No. Comments? Ditto. Okay. Ditto. Okay. All right. I guess you got what you needed? Yes, sir. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, no new business. Let's go on to uh, reports. Councilmember Gunter, report. No report. Councilmember Nelson. Uh, I just wanted to say that I attended the Horizon Council annual meeting along with the mayor on Friday. Um, and it was a great meeting, very positive, talked a lot about some different opportunities we have in Lee County, potentially um, autonomous vehicles, which is one of the seminars that I went to at the National League of Cities uh, back in December in San Antonio. So it was very interesting to see the presentation on that. I also attended my first golf course committee meeting. As I told the other members of the committee, I don't know anything about golf, but I do know a few things about business development. So I'm happy to be on that committee to assist and see if there are some opportunities where we can maybe get some funds prioritized to up, make some updates to our golf course. So stay tuned, I'll keep reporting out as I have those meetings. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Welsh. Um, <clears throat> the only thing I have to report is that I attended the City of Cape Coral's 50th anniversary, which is a really nice event, and uh, Council Member Nelson was there too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> she forgot that one, huh? Forgot. <laughs> Council Member Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Last Friday, um, Isaac Salver, who was the president of the Florida League of Cities, came down to visit. Uh, he attended the youth council meeting that day. Um, they did a great job. He was very impressed. He's bringing a program to the various cities, um, teaching high school, all schools from uh, K to 12, um, what local government's all about, uh, civics program. Uh, hopefully, the, our youth council can participate in that somehow taking it out to the schools. Uh, we'll be getting the documentation for that fairly soon. Um, and the council members also will be tasked to go out to the schools if they care to with this program. So, um, but anyway, I was really happy. You know, the, the uh, council members did a great job. He was extremely happy and, and complimentary of our group. So um, I'm proud of him. I really am. So it's a great program. Um, Next week, I will be in Tallahassee. I'm leaving Sunday morning, and I'll be back Wednesday night uh, to lobby with our, uh, our becker Polyakov lobbyist, uh, lobby the legislature on uh, HB 1011. That's a good one. Um, also, uh, make sure that we're getting the money that they're working toward uh, allotting for projects that we have. So it, uh, every time we send somebody up, it usually is fairly successful. So I'm looking forward to it. It's a lot of work, a lot of running around. Also on Wednesday uh, morning, I'm trying to think. I looked at the calendar. I can't remember one day to the next. Um, there is a Florida League of Cities Board of Directors meeting that I will be attending. And then I'll be headed home. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Cariosha? No report. Councilmember Cosden. Thank you, Mayor. I also attended the 50th anniversary Jubilee, Cape Coral. That was nice. Um, the Coast to Heartland National Estuary Policy Committee. I am on that. Uh, I'm the representative from Cape Coral. I attended that on the 17th. And on Friday, I was able to watch the um, 
staff and FGCU team install the canister at the Public Works building that, where they're doing air quality testing. That was really cool to see. Um, and I also went to a Habitat for Humanity home dedication that day. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was kind of busy. I went to the 50th anniversary, the light up of the building right here at City Hall. And I also attended the uh, Chamber of Commerce Awards dinner and uh, installation of their new boards of directors. And then uh, along with Councilmember Williams, I also attended the Youth Council meeting, but I had the opportunity to meet with the uh, Florida League of City President, Isaac Salver, both before and after the council meeting. And boy, Rick, was he impressed with those kids you got there and the work that they're doing. Uh, so it was good to see him again. I've met him at the uh, some of the Florida League of City conferences in the past, so I, I knew him. Uh, and we had a good, solid meeting. Uh, I also attended the 50th anniversary Jubilee celebration and gala. I also went to the uh, Cultural Park uh, concert, jamming in Cultural Park the next day. Uh, I attended the groundbreaking for the new county and city uh, Littleton Kismet realignment project, which has gotten underway. We broke ground. And of course, I, along with Councilmember Nelson, attended the uh, Horizon Council general membership meeting. And then, of course, uh, yesterday, I popped out at the Ground Owl Day and had some fun over there at Rotary Park. And I want to remind the residents that on the 29th of February, we have the Burrowing Owl Festival over at Rotary Park, which is a great event. With that, I'll move on to reports. Madam City Attorney? I have no report. Mr. Zerlag? No report. All right, time and place of future meetings. A regular meeting of Cape Coral City Council is scheduled for Monday, February 10th, 2020 at 4.30 here in Council Chambers. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Second, all in favor? Aye. Meeting adjourned.